So hey guys, welcome to our channel Fiction Domain. And also welcome to the another amazing story on what if Naruto had the nine tails and seven wings. Here is short summary. Naruto is injured whilst trying to defend Jiraiya and is swept away by the river. As death seems to be near, he is flung into a hidden village where he is saved from drowning by someone as special as he is. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. The waters seem to be trying to crush him and guide him all at once as he flowed along limply, wondering how it had all come to this. It wasn't like running into Iowa Scouts was on the training schedule. No, and neither was getting stabbed in the chest by a stray jutsu intended for his master. Stupid sense of loyalty. Still, at least he had pushed Jureya out of the way in time. If only there hadn't been a cliff directly behind them. Honestly, he thought it was a wonder that he was even alive at this point. Just how long had he been underwater? Was the fox keeping him alive? Yeah, that would be about right. He knew enough that if he were to die then so would the nine tails trapped inside of him. Still, he thought tiredly, this isn't the way I wanted to go. The water began dragging him deeper as the flow of the river sped up. He was far too weak to put up any resistance. He didn't even feel the need to breathe. Was this what dying felt like? Where was the long dark tunnel with the light at the end? Where were the flashes of his life up until this moment where his life was surely about to end? Wasn't that the way it was supposed to go? It certainly screwed things up for his plans, dying that is. He wouldn't be able to keep his promise to Sakura and bring Sasuke back to the village the way they both wanted. In that moment, both of his friends appeared before him, smiling at him like they used to when they were on the same team. Come on, Naruto, are you really gonna stop trying? Sakura asked, her arms crossed the way she did when she was upset, what happened to all that yelling about becoming Hokage? You can't do that if you're dead, you know. Naruto wanted to respond, but found himself drifting away slowly, overcome by his weakened state as he was. Naruto Sasuke said, looking at him with a hint of pity, we both left the village so we could get stronger. Is this as far as you can go? If that's so, then you can never hope to defeat me, dead last. Naruto grit his teeth weakly over that, attempting to move his arms, and only succeeded in pushing himself deeper into the black abyss, as the river sucked him deeper and deeper, until darkness overcame him. She hummed happily for once as she looked down at the village from her home in the large tree in the center of the village. It was a nice day. The sun was shining, and there was a lovely breeze blowing softly through the leaves. She sat on a large thick limb overlooking the lake down below, her legs swinging back and forth. She may have wanted to be among the people, but, given their hatred of what she was, she couldn't regret her decision to move out of the hovel she lived in before her life as a shinobi and build her own little slice of paradise here in the tree. It hadn't been all that hard as she had imagined it would be. Using materials she'd found all over the village that had been discarded, she'd built herself a nice, sturdy treehouse, well out of the reach of the people that disliked her. Most of the shinobi population didn't care one way or the other whether she lived or died on a mission. As long as she did her job, then that was all that was needed. Though, some of them feared her just as much as the civilian population did. Fact of the matter was, apart from Shibuki, there wasn't anyone that she could actually call a real friend inside the waterfall village. Such was the life of Fuu, Jinchuriki of the seven-winged beetle, Chimei. Of course, Chimei herself didn't count. She was a prison for the beast, and the beast a prisoner. Still, as the girl sat on a branch overlooking the village, the loneliness was enough to drive her up the walls. The Mei often spoke to her, and the tailed beast's voice sometimes ebbed away at her loneliness, but she craved human contact. And see beyond the village's territory. She was never allowed to venture beyond their borders, as much as she wanted to. The Mei had given her the ultimate freedom, as the beast had put it, in giving the girl a pair of wings at her back. Few loved them. She loved to fly, and flit about without so much as a care in the world when she was feeling low. She would even fly high above the village, out of their protective valley in wonder of the sky above her. Still, she thought as she tucked her legs close to her body, looking forlornly at the ever-flowing falls around her village, I'll never be totally free. Not until they find another body to put Jamei in, then I'm as good as dead. You shouldn't think like that, little one Jamei chided gently, you will be free someday, and it will not because I have been moved to a new host. Fu gave out a small giggle, and what should we do, Jamei? Dessert. I'm all for it the beast said, be honest, Fu, how many people would you actually miss aside from Shibuki? Fu conceded the point. There weren't many that she would miss in the village. But going rogue wasn't something she had written down on her bucket list. Few people that host my kind aren't even treated as human. Jamei went on, sighing loudly. My previous hosts were all treated horribly. One of them actually committed suicide. You can imagine what kind of stir that caused. It was a mad dash to find someone to take me on before he was totally gone. Few shivered at that. 
Chimei had shared many stories of her past hosts with her, and, apparently, she was one of the more sociable tailed beasts apart from the four-tailed lava monkey. The person in which was referring to had been around her age, and the hatred of him and Chimei had been worse than what she had been through. She was about to respond when she noticed something. Off about the waterfall. For a moment, the water turned a pinkish hue, and then to red. Blood red. What the hell. She then noticed something falling through the falls and down into the lake. That was a body. Chimei shouted, get over there. Whoever it is might still be alive. Way ahead of you, Chimei. Fiu shouted and leapt from the branch and sprouted wings from her lower back. She flew down and over the surface of the water in search of the body that fell from the falls. When she reached the falls, all she found, though, was a flow of red moving with the water. Taking a deep breath, she dove down into the water, using her wings to propel herself down. She followed the trail of bloodied water deeper down and soon saw the outline of a body. She flirted her wings and pushed herself deeper, reaching out to grasp the arm of the body she saw. She then hauled back and pushed her wings to the maximum speed back to the surface. She burst through, gasping for breath and rocketed into the air. She looked down at her charge, seeing a head of blonde hair and a pale tanned face. He looks really bad she thought to her beast, I don't know if I have the supplies to. You, whatever you do, do not take him to the village. Jamei shouted, nearly deafening her, I can sense one of my kind within him, and from the strength of the chakra, it can only be the nine tails. Fu looked down at the man in her grasp and flew back to her home double quick, already feeling the eyes of the villagers on her as she moved. She didn't have much time before the shinobi got nosy. She landed right on her doorstep and dragged the man inside. She laid him down on her bedding, stripping off his ruined orange and black jacket, only to freeze as she saw the size of the wound in his side. Oh, gods. She paled, bile rising in her throat. Focus, little one Chimei said soothingly, the nine tails can stop the bleeding, but you need to give him air and force the water out of his lungs. If you don't, my brother won't even be able to save him. There she thought, right. She pinched his nose closed and pried his mouth open, molding her lips over his own and forced as much air into his lungs as she could manage. Then she worked on his chest, pumping it to get the air flowing and the water out. It worked, as only a moment later the man spewed water out of his mouth, coughing and gasping for air. Fu rolled him onto his side to help him expel the water, only to have him collapse back onto the bed, shuddering. He's freezing, she mumbled, reaching out to get the soaked clothing off of him. She would have been embarrassed had she not been so worried that he'd die right there and then if she didn't get him warm enough fast. After getting him out of his clothes she worked fast to get him dry and piled every blanket she had over him before she got a fire roaring in the hearth. To her, the room was sweltering, but the young man was still shaking horribly. Seeing no other choice, Fu pulled her clothes off and got under the covers with him. She shivered involuntarily as she felt the biting chill of his body against her own. He's so cold she thought at her tenant, what more can I do for him? The maid didn't answer. The beast knew full well that the young man was only suffering from the after effects of the cold waters and blood loss. The nine tails would soon put that to rest as his will to survive kicked in. She was more interested in the effect he was having on Fu. It was the first time the girl had been so desperate to save another, and, given how prideful she could be, gone so far to do so. From Chimei's point of view, she could tell the man was perhaps a year younger than her little one was, sixteen at least, and he was rather handsome. The blonde hair and whisker-like marks gave him a roguish look. Blondes were rare outside of Kumo, but this man didn't have the complexion of someone from those lands. Either they were very dark or extremely light-skinned people, mostly having blonde or white hair. While the beast was wool-gathering, Fu's companion had stopped shivering from the combined heat of the blankets, fire, and Fu's own warmth as the girl curled against him, one arm across his chest. He was now sleeping peacefully, his breath coming easier. It was a relief to the girl that he was doing better and relaxed her slightly as she felt him warming up. As close as she was, Fu couldn't help but feel how sculpted his body was, much to her growing embarrassment. He was hard, almost like a piece of carved stone, showing that whoever the man was, none of his muscle was forced, but earned through work. There was also the fact that Jamei had pegged him as a Jinchuriki like she was. And for the nine tails of all beasts. If he's got the nine tails she thought tiredly, her eyes beginning to droop, he must be from Kanoha. The Kanoha shinobi in her village was bad news. The village itself was small and had very few jobs as far as their shinobi forces went, and their daimyo was all but a simple farmer. Rumor had it that soon their lands would be taken over by either the fire daimyo or water daimyo. Whether or not their village would survive was all up in the air. But if this man was from another shinobi village, their own daimyo would no doubt demand compensation from his home in return for his health, the fact that he held one of the tailed beasts was only fuel on the fire. He was politically priceless. What was she supposed to do with him, now, though? 
She agreed with Shimei that taking him down to the village was a bad idea, for more reasons than she could count. One Jinchuriki was barely tolerated, but two would cause a riot. Shibuki wouldn't be able to protect him, either. At best, he would be a political hostage in poor health, and at the worst, killed so that the nine tails could be extracted and placed in a vessel of their own choosing. Deciding that it would be better to figure such things out when the man awoke, Fu was almost asleep alongside him. That is until the door was pounded on loudly. Fu. Roared a familiar voice, Fu, I know you have someone in there. Come out and explain yourself right now. Shibuki. She sat up in panic, drawing one of the blankets up to wrap around herself. No, there's no need to worry. She thought, trying to calm herself as she scrambled about for her clothes, he won't just barge in here. He knows better. Fu, I'm warning you, Shibuki yelled, the Anbu are with me, and I'm afraid I can't allow you to keep whoever that is with you. Go away. Fu shouted, her temper flaring up. Shibuki could be heard grumbling, Fu, be reasonable. The person is a stranger, and likely an enemy shinobi, I can't just let you. Fu stepped up and slammed her fist against the door, rattling her whole house, I said leave. She shouted, I found him, and he's hurt. I'm not gonna let you make things worse. We'll help him, I promise. Shibuki shouted, Fu, you don't realize what you're doing. People already ask me to restrict you, but this will force my hand. I'll have to. The what? She shouted angrily, lock me up. I'm already a prisoner. I can never leave this damned village, even if I gave up being a shinobi. You just put me in a cell. Never. Shibuki yelled from outside, Fu, I'd never do that to you. Come on, Shibuki, you know there's no reasoning with that thing. Someone said angrily. I am the cage of this village, Shibuki hissed, and what chance do you think you would have if you just barged in there? She'd kill you in a second. Fu ground her teeth, get out of here, or else I lose enough poison to make the whole village sick. She growled, you know I can do that. You wouldn't. Shibuki snapped, angered now, Fu, I'm warning you. No. She pushed out the door and came face to face with him and three other masked shinobi, her wings buzzing angrily, I'm warning you. He's barely alive, and if you hurt him, or even attempt to hurt him, I won't be the perfect little pet you've seen so far. She yelled, angry tears coming to her eyes, I've got wings for a reason, and so help me, I'll use them to make you hate me more than this stupid village does. Bright orange powder started wafting from her wings in her agitation, making the man stumble back in fear of her toxins, for so long I've done nothing but do whatever you ask of me, never even going beyond our borders, never complaining about how the people treat me, even though I've never done anything to them. I want nothing more than to be normal, but I never got that chance. She advanced, more toxins fluttering from her wings, making the men back away, Fu, please, you know I've done everything I can to help you thus far. Shibuki said, still trying to reason with the girl, but Fu was done listening. And I love you for that, she said tearfully, but I'm tired of being stared at. Tired of being hated for no reason other than the fact that this village made me something to be hated. She sobbed and pointed back to her home, he's like me, Shibuki. Just like me. And if I let you take him, you'll kill him, just to get what he holds to make you and the village stronger. Shibuki's eye widened at the girl's proclamation, you mean he's. No. Fu shouted, I told you I found him. He's mine. Don't be selfish. One of the Anbu shouted, if he's who you say he is, think of the political value he could. Selfish Fu roared, her eyes flashing dangerously as a red shroud bubbled up around her slight body, when have I ever been selfish? Until now, never. I never asked for anything that you hadn't already provided, but now I'm trying to save someone, and you're telling me I'm being selfish. And now, phew, he didn't mean it. Shibuki yelped as the veil covered her, we're all just worried about. Rather than yell, Fu sprouted two more sets of wings, bringing the total up to six, and kicked up a whirlwind, sending the shinobi spinning and sprawling all the way down the giant tree. Lucky for them that they were sticking to the bark with chakra. Fu, however, was beyond furious. So furious that she was sending out toxic dust in all directions. It settled around her little cabin in the trees, on the leaf, and on the branches. To her, it posed no threat at all, but to any other form of life that got too close, it acted as a foul-smelling, vomit-inducing barrier. Fu calmed herself and whirled back into her house, slamming the door behind her. She sighed, well, now I've really done it, huh? A deep, amused chuckle rumbled through her thoughts. I would say so. Chimei said, Fu imagining a smile on the beast's face, if she could smile, that is. I dare say that they won't bother you for a while after that little tirade. Fu nodded and went to check on her house guest. I acted like a spoiled child. She muttered, finding the man still asleep, despite the yelling that had gone on. This isn't good if they come back. With all of that poison dust you spread. Jimei chattered laughingly, Shibuki may be timid as a mouse, but he's no fool, my dear. 
Fu smirked at that and went to the basin she collected rain water from, filling a small bowl with it and taking a cloth from the kitchen area. She knelt back down at the man's side, dipping the cloth in, and started wiping away the sweat now dotting his face. He stirred slightly at the cool touch of the cloth and Fu stilled for a moment as his eyes fluttered. Open those eyes of yours soon, my friend, she whispered more to herself rather than the sleeping shinobi, I want to see what color they are. I wonder if they're as amazing as this hair of yours. He's a strong one, this boy Chime said, a hint of laughter still in her voice, old Kurama was never one to be placed inside of someone weak. Whoever this young man is, I bet he's got the power to back up holding him back. Kurama. Few asked mentally, is that the name of the Nine Tails? It is, dear, but I wouldn't mention that to the young man if he doesn't know it already, and I'll bet he doesn't. The beast said, sighing loudly, Kurama never gave his name to anyone that I can recall. He always viewed anyone other than himself as inferior. Even his own kind. Few rolled her eyes, he sounds lovely, she said, speaking aloud while stabbing away at the blonde's face, what do you think he's like? Who's to say, little one the seven tails sighed, but I have to say, claiming him as yours was quite bold, my little hornet. Few's face colored brightly at that. She hadn't really meant it in the way it sounded, but. Oh, no. She moaned, Shibuki must think I'm. What he thinks doesn't matter, Few Jimei said, it doesn't matter what anyone says, as a matter of fact. Let them say what they want. Words are only words and only hurt you if you let them. She said, and by the way, he's waking up. Fu yelped quietly as her guest began to stir, his face twisted in slight pain. Try not to move too much, she said hastily, letting him know she was there as he tried to open his eyes, you're not strong enough, yet. The blonde groaned, where? Am. I? He asked weakly. Fu smiled and placed a calming hand on his cheek, you're in the village hidden within the waterfalls, she said as his eyes began to open slowly, and you're safe with me. Her smile widened as his eyes revealed themselves to be a blue so deep that she couldn't recall ever seeing such a color in human eyes before. Those same eyes stared straight into her orange ones, are you? An angel. Demay nearly laughed herself silly at the rate Fu's heart sped up as her face flooded with color. I am no angel. Just a girl. She said, trying to ignore Jamei's laughter, my name is Fu. I'm Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki. He sighed as his eyes fell shut once again, drifting away to unconsciousness. Shibuki sighed as he watched Fu's poison dust glimmering in the sunlight, a clear sign that the girl meant business. The elders were going to be on the warpath after this, he just knew it. All of this over an injured boy. He said, shaking his head. Suddenly, a heavy hand landed on his shoulder in an iron grip, and what injured boy would that be? A deep voice growled as the man turned, looking up at the large man standing behind him, wild spiky white hair blowing in the breeze. LL Lord Jiraiya. Shibuki stammered, WH what are you doing here? Jiraiya grasped his other shoulder and hoisted the timid cage off of the ground, I'm looking for my apprentice who saved my life. Jiraiya growled, now, what injured boy are you talking about? Above the hidden waterfalls village stood two figures cloaked in black and red. Of the two, the most notable carried a large scythe over his shoulder and had stark white hair and a mad grin adorning his face. So, you really think the little bastard's down there? He asked his large companion. The big man grunted, if Tadara saw things right after the riot he caused, then the river should have floated that little money bag right here, he said, dull black eyes narrowing at the sight of his former home. HN, I'd hope never to come back to this little hovel. Still, two of our targets are here, and one of them should be an easy catch. CH, yeah, stupid little fuck shoulder just let the old man take that earth spear and gotten his ass out of there, huh? The white-haired man snickered, kneeling over the ledge, think we'll find the other one. If I were a betting man, I'd say most definitely, the big man said, Taki is weak compared to the other villages, and they wouldn't risk losing a bargaining chip like a Jinchuriki. He smiled beneath his mask, still, if that blonde brat floated here as I believe he did, then that old man must not be too far behind him. That'll make two nice bounties on our hands. The white-haired man chuckled, the old man I get, but how the fuck did the brat get such a high bounty? Twenty billion Ryo isn't a fucking slap on the wrist. His companion took out a small black book and began flipping through it, hmm, apparently he went berserk in a small village a year or so back and killed a few people, he said, chuckling, and it was within Iwa's boundaries, heh, so that's why Dadara led them in like that. He takes a shot, and we make the kill, the smaller man laughed manically, too bad, I wanted to have a go at the little bastard that gave poor Kissam such a hard time. Still staring down at the book the man nodded, for once, I feel the same, he said, looking over the file of a blonde young man in the book, kids dangerous for someone so young. Just the kind of hunt I like. Well, Kakuzu, if we wanna catch him, then we'd better get the fuck down there. Just try to keep your head on, Hayden. 
Gareya brushed past the Anbu standing in his way, physically assaulting one that was foolish enough to try and stop his advance, slamming him in the FACE mask and knocking him out. Shibuki fluttered uselessly behind him, trying to slow him, though he was wise enough not to get too close. Lord Jiraiya, I really must protest this. The man shouted, I understand your worry for your apprentice, but you cannot simply barge into my village and start snooping about. Gareya didn't even turn to the man as he spoke, and I told you that boy is everything to me. He growled, I've trained him for three years, naming him my heir as a toad summoner, and in a moment of carelessness, I allowed him to be nearly fatally injured. If he's really here, then you will not stop me from getting to him and taking him home. But I am the cage. Shibuki yelled boldly, trying to use his authority. But the man just scoffed, I don't care if you're the daimyo. Get in my way, and I'll turn you into a toad. Shibuki paled at the threat, but if you disturb all of that poison foo spread out, the village will suffer. Gureya just rolled his eyes, am I to understand that no one here uses wind or fire? He asked rhetorically. Water, primarily, Shinbuki answered anyway. Gureya just leapt from the docks and scaled the tree, ignoring further protests. When he reached the little cabin in the tree, he found it covered in a shimmering purple dust. He ran through a series of hand signs, wind style. Great breakthrough. Inside the cabin, Fu was preparing a simple meal of rice for her guest, when the whole cabin shook and swayed as a massive gale of wind struck it, unsettling a few things from the walls. What in the? Fire style. Great fireball jutsu. She fluttered to the window just in time to see her poison powder being blown away from the tree in a great cloud and collide with a large ball of flames and explode, destroying her toxins. Oh, no. The door crashed open, startling her as a bear of a man stood in the frame. She darted over to where Naruto lay sleeping, shielding him from attack. Don't go near him. Chimei shouted loudly, that man is powerful and has almost as much chakra as the boy. Boo trembled visibly, he's that strong. Step away, girl, the man said, well I thank you for caring for him, that boy is my responsibility. He can't be moved, Fu yelped, her voice trembling, he's far too weak. Gureya's face fell slightly, but he lives. Fu nodded. Then you have no need to worry about me. He said, stepping into the room, closing the door behind him and bolting it, as the wind began to close. Barely, she said, looking over her shoulder at the boy, I've only just gotten him out of danger. Gureya nodded and moved to sit next to prone blonde as Fu scooted out of the way. The man's face was worn with worry as he looked at the blonde sleeping face. Has he woken? He asked without looking at the girl. Once, she relented, he was really weak and fell back asleep almost immediately after he told me his name. She said, regarding the man with a little fear, if. If you don't mind me asking, how did he get such a horrible wound? The man nodded, we were on our way home, actually. He began, we were entering the land of fire, skirting around an Iowa outpost, but someone set off a set of explosives, and somehow we were blamed for it. He said, shaking his head, Naruto wanted to avoid a fight, so we turned tail and made for the border, but that didn't stop our pursuers. Next thing we knew, we were skirting around Serpent's Gorge under fire from those Iwa shinobi pursuing us. I wasn't quick enough to dodge all of the attacks and nearly bought it, but he pushed me out of the way. And took the attack himself and got knocked into the river in the gorge. Who bit her lip, he fell from the northern falls when I caught sight of him, she explained, I don't know how he survived when he was bleeding out so much into the water, but I suppose it could have been the Nine Tails. You know. Jureya's eyes hardened before softening, ah, I see, you're Taki's seven-tailed Jinchuriki. Fu nodded and bowed slightly, my name's Fu, sir. Jureya scooted back from the bed, turning himself around while he sat and took to his knees, bowing his head to the floor, I am Jureya, Toad Sage of Mount. Mayaboku and one of the Leafs' legendary Sanin, he said, and I thank you for taking care of my student and heir. He lifted his head to see a very surprised girl looking at him in shock, there are many things I could offer you as thanks for your care and protection of him, but I fear what you would ask I have no power to give. I'd ask you to take me with you, Fu admitted with a nod of her head, Shibuki's already furious with me for not letting him take Naruto, but with me spreading all of that dust around, I. Gureya held up his hand for silence, I understand, and again, I thank you for defending my apprentice. He said, smiling slightly at the girl's bravery, Shibuki seemed like he wanted me as far from your little home as possible, but my threat seldom end in empty words if not heeded, as for your treatment, the compensation I can offer Shibuki should shut the village up well enough. Still. Fu mumbled, but before she could go on, there was a knock at the door. Jureya smirked and gestured toward the door with his head. Fu scowled, but not at all the same, and the man rose. He opened the door to reveal the timid village leader, looking nervous at coming face to face with the legendary leaf shinobi once again. Lord Jiraiya, he said nervously, casting a worried look at the girl, who had moved in front of Naruto again. 
She was less on edge with the man than she would have been with anyone else, and he was alone. I trust your apprentice as well. Gureya nodded, stepping aside to allow him inside, well enough that he will recover within a few hours. He said as the man moved past him. But I believe we have business to discuss. Shibuki nodded as he took a seat at the fireplace, which was still burning brightly, thanks to Fu. I suppose we do. Gureya took a seat opposite of the man, sinking into the lotus position, and bowed his head, first of all, I would thank you as I did young Fu for your care of my apprentice. Chibuki shook his head, you need not thank me, Lord Jiraiya. My own people would have let him bleed to death before helping him. He said shamefully, we are a small and mistrustful people. Outsiders are rare and unwelcome. He looked over to Fu where she was tending Naruto, Fu, however, has always had a kind heart and would never leave anyone to such a fate. All your thanks should go to her. Be that as it may, she is a shinobi under your rule, he said, reaching into his robes, as such your village is owed compensation for the life of my student, he pulled out a checkbook and pen, the bounty on Naruto is roughly 20 billion, he said, and began writing down a number, I intend to give you triple that amount. A 60 Shibuki gulped, why so much? Giriaya finished writing out the check and handed it to the village leader, for one thing, Naruto is not only my apprentice, but my adopted son, he said, making Fu gasp. And the second would be that he is also the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox. Therefore he is valuable to the leaf. Shibuki took the slip of paper hesitantly, I must thank you for being so generous, Lord Jiraiya, he said, slipping the check into his robes, our village has fallen on hard times recently, with the civil war in Kiri finally ending. Jiraiya nodded, I'm well aware. We've passed through the Mist Village once or twice during our travels. He said, sighing, I can tell you that the loss of the Three Tails has everyone on edge. If Naruto had been known back then, he would have been made into a bigger target than he was just by being with me. He said, looking from the village leader to the girl tending his apprentice, which brings me to my second order of business. Fu. Me? Fu looked up from dabbing Naruto's face with a cloth. Fu. Shibuki asked, looking at the girl, what about her? Gureya took a deep breath before continuing, as you are aware, Kiri is now bereft of a Jinchuriki, the so-called weapon of the five great villages. He said, crossing his arms, the three tails has yet to reform itself, and the bearer of the six tails is AWOL, so they will be looking for ways to bolster their firepower. You believe that they will come after us, it wasn't a question that the timid village leader posed. He was well aware that the border patrols had reported several scouts from Kiri moving around their village, searching for the entrance. The barrier around the village was not a strong one, because their village was naturally hidden by the surrounding valley, but if someone got close enough, they could find the village. I know they will, Jiraiya said, nodding, which is why, given that the girl saved my son and heir, I would like to take her into my care. Fu looked at the man with wide eyes for a moment. Dare she hope she could finally leave the village. Shibuki sighed, Lord Jiraiya, I know that we will likely be invaded by Kiri, but that is all the more reason that we will need her. He said, frowning, our village is on the verge of poverty, with fewer and fewer missions coming in from the surrounding villages in need of shinobi services, and if we are invaded by a larger village, then... Then it will be a massacre, Jiraiya said, looking the man in the eyes coldly, of all the people in this village, I cannot sense anyone aside from Fu that could hold their own against someone of Yugura's caliber, let alone Mei Turumi. Fu would die here if she fought and would be treated no better than an animal, given how Yugura treated his people. I can't just give her to you, Shibuki protested with a shake of his head. Jiraiya nodded, I wouldn't ask you to simply give her over, he said, holding up his checkbook up once more, Naruto's bounty added to my own is 200 billion, he said, flipping the book open, for Fu's life, I will offer you three times that amount. Shibuki and Fu both felt their jaws drop. S6 billion. Why? Fu cried, voicing a slightly irritated tone. Jiraiya turned to the girl with a somber look, it's not the freedom that you desired, Fu, but I can think of little else that I can do to let you see the outside of your village. He said by way of apology before returning his attention back to Shibuki, I know that you are not like the rest of your village, Shibuki. I have heard the whispers of your kindness toward this girl, even though the rest of your village fears her. You are her only friend, and it is as her friend that I ask this of you. He bowed his head low, take my offer, and allow the girl to finally live. Shibuki looked torn. On the one hand, his council of elders, greedy as they were, would scoff at the idea of giving up their equalizer. The possession of a Jinchuriki made them an important balance keeper, since both Kumo and Iwa had two Jinchuriki each, as would Kiri if the bearer of the six tails ever be found. Kanoha and Suna each had a single vessel containing one of the beasts, and Taki was right in the middle as the smallest, weakest of all the villages to possess one of the fabled containers. On the other hand, what the Leaf Sanin was offering was enough money to buy out their own daimyo. The man was low-born, merely an elected official from one of their own to keep the peace among their people. 
Once, he had been a powerful shinobi, but now he was fat and complacent, just as any noble would be. The money would, of course, feed his people and bolster his village's defenses, but that wouldn't last long. Not without Fu around to act as a deterrent to other villages. There was literally no right answer to give the Sanin. Yes, there is the man thought angrily, you already know that Fu's as good as dead after her little stunt. The village will never forgive such an act, whether I say no or not. He growled, clenching his fists in his lap angrily before he looked up at the man, keep your money. He said, waving off the man's checkbook, the moment your son is well enough to travel, take the girl and go. Boo gasped as the words registered. She was free. Just like that. Ureya nodded, take that other slip I gave you, and disappear, my friend. He all but commanded, live a proper life. Find a real home, and fall in love, maybe even raise a family. He said, his eyes narrowing, it won't be long until Naruto recovers, but what time we spend here will cost a great deal. When the gates open, take your life and flee the flood that comes. Chibuki shook his head, the people of this village, while some of them are foolish and greedy, are still mine to protect. He said, sighing with a tired smile, I may not be a true cage, but I am still the leader of this village. Well said, Jiraiya nodded to him, smiling as he rose, I would like to purchase supplies we will likely need for the journey home. Will you guide me around your market? Shibuki smiled slightly and rose to join the man. Fu, however, fluttered after him, her wings sprouting almost instantly as she flashed to his side. Why? She asked him. Shibuki smiled down at the girl and patted her on the head, because I want you to live. Daughter. Lots of eyes, Kakuzu, Hayden muttered to his partner, his weapon concealed beneath his cloak, what's the plan? Kakuzu grunted, we play it safe for now, he said, keeping his voice low. The people here are suspicious of strangers, and that hasn't changed in over a hundred years. He nodded to the large tree within the middle of the village. Let's just focus on the main target. The Nine Tails Brad is near that tree, and from the feel of his chakra, he's still recovering, but fast. Aiden shrugged, so we go in, knock his ass out, and drag him back to leader, simple. The big man shook his head, not so simple. He said, I can sense another nearby. Someone almost as strong as he is. I'm willing to bet that it's either Jiraiya or the Seven Tails. Aiden scoffed, the only way that old toad could have beaten us here is a summoning seal. Jiraiya of the Sanin is a renowned master of seals, Kakuzu pointed out. A summoning seal would be simple for someone like him, especially since that boy is his apprentice. He said, shaking his head, but I believe it to be the Seven Tails, because I can sense their chakra, as well as Jiraiya's. He's down here among the villagers. Aiden looked around, smiling a little. Well, if you'd like to go after the brat, I can keep the old man entertained. How? Kakuzu asked, his eyes narrowed. The woman passed by the pair as he spoke his question. Hayden grinned madly at her before his robes flared. Red and black steel cut into flesh, a scream erupting from the woman's mouth as blood splattered the ground. The white-haired rogue laughed madly. Lord Jashin thirsts for blood, he said, his scythe raised, the blades dripping red, I'll turn the lake red with blood in his name. The screaming of the people below was what let Fu know that something was wrong. She went to the windows, peering down to see smoke rising from the village. What's going on down there? She wondered aloud, fearing for Shibuki and her sleeping charge. It's best to stay put, little Wanchime put in soothingly, Jiraiya is down there, and if there's any threat to the boy or the village, it's doubtful that he'll just stand about doing nothing. I know, and you're right, but it's hard staying up here while the village is being attacked she said to the Seven Tails, the children. Suddenly the door of her home was kicked open, startling her against the wall. In the frame of the door stood a man much taller than Jiraiya had been as he crouched down through the door. His face was concealed by a loose mask around his mouth, leaving only his sickly black eyes visible. He also wore a taki headband with a score right through it. A rogue shinobi. How fortunate, the man said as he stepped into her home, both of my targets are right in the same place, and one of them's already at death's door. He said, looking down at the sleeping blonde. The kuzu. Chimera ord, startling her host at the venom in her normally gentle voice, treacherous cretin. Boo trembled at the mention of the man's name. She had heard tales of the monstrous creature that had once been the village's most powerful shinobi and a candidate for the village leader. But he grew greedy and hungered for money and power, stealing the village's most forbidden techniques, allowing him to live for centuries if he so wished it. All he needed was to keep stealing the hearts of his victims. But the girl, despite her fears, put herself between him and the young shinobi under her care. I won't let you touch him. She yelled, even as her young voice trembled and cracked in her nervousness at facing the man before her. The Kuzu chuckled, and what would you do to stop me, little insect? He sneered as Fu's wings sprouted from her back, dust drifting down from them, yes, I know you, little Jinchuriki. If you fight me here, you'll spread that poison of yours all over the place. Well it won't affect me, it will most certainly affect your comrade there. 
he said, pointing toward Naruto, and given his weakened state, he wouldn't survive even a small dose of your toxins. Gu growled in agitation, I've got more up my sleeve than my poison dust. She clapped her hands together, wind style. Wing blaster. Four more wings sprouted from her back, bring the total to six, and buzzed loudly as a gale of wind kicked up and blasted toward the rogue Taki Shinobi. Bakuzu raised his arms to protect himself, not expecting the girl to go on the offensive right off the bat with the nine tails so close at hand, and was blasted right out of the wall and against the bark of the giant tree. His body left an imprint, but it was nothing for the immortal shinobi as he easily pushed himself out, glaring toward the house. Fu fluttered out, her six wings sparkling with variously colored dusts, if you want Naruto, then you'll have to deal with me first, she yelled as a crimson chakra began to bubble around her, I am Fu, Kanoichi of Takigakur no Sato, Jinchuriki and friend to Chimei, the seven-winged beetle. I won't lose to the likes of you, traitor. Bakuzu grunted in preparation for the fight at hand, grasping his cloak and pulling it away from his body. Fu was shocked to see much of his body was stitched together with black threads that seemed to have a life of their own, while the rest was covered in five different animal masks. We'll see about that, little insect. B equals down, B E L O W equals. The man screamed as the scythe sliced through his midsection, falling dead at the feet of his killer, as Haydn laughed madly. The man had long since discarded his cloak and was covered in blood from head to toe, his scythe dripping with it as he surrounded himself with his victims. Ah, Lord Jashin is pleased, he said to himself, licking blood from his lips, but he is never satisfied. He advanced after the remaining villagers, all of whom were fleeing, not even putting up a fight against the mad cultist. More, Haydn grinned, I have to kill more. Water style. Water dragon jutsu. Shinuki roared from behind the man as the waters of the lake sprang to life at his command, surging forth in the shape of a monstrous dragon, jaws agape, toward the rogue. Haydn merely cackled as he raised his weapon and sliced right through the dragon. Shibuki didn't falter as he brought his hands together for another jutsu, Water Senbon. The water around Haydn broke from the body of the slain dragon and formed into thousands of needles before shooting at Haydn, continuing the attack. Haydn took the attack head on, not even flinching as he was pierced by the tiny darts. As the man slumped, leaning on his side, Shibuki hoped that he had bested him, but that was not to be as the man raised his head with that mad grin on his face again. You. You're worthy of Lord Jashin. He whipped the scythe around and hurled it toward the village leader. Shibuki leapt aside as the weapon sped past him, only for T come back around as the weapon segmented, coming at him from his right. Bending his knees low, he barely managed to avoid the deadly blades as they passed over him. He then shot forward, ducking under Haydn's guard, and kicked him out onto the lake surface. Flashing through his seals, Shibuki leapt out onto the water, water style. Exploding bite of the water dragon. Several pillars of water erupted from the lake, striking Haydn and sending him straight into the air. Cackling loudly he sent his scythe toward the leader. Unable to move because of the technique, Shibuki was forced to take the hit as her clasped his hands together, forming the pillars of water into a massive water dragon and sending it crashing into the rogue. The scythe, luckily, just grazed his shoulder, leaving a small cut in its wake. Haydn was at the mercy of the dragon as it grasped him in its jaws and hurled him back toward the ground harshly. He crashed into the village, raising a sizable dust cloud. Shibuki sank to his knees, his chakra exhausted, relieved that the battle was over. Or so he thought. The mad laughter of the Akatsuki came from the ruined village as the man began to rise from the debris. Shibuki scrambled back to land, searching for a chakra pill within his field pouch to allow him to fight again. But as he reached land once more, he found himself restrained by Jiraiya. The man was looking coldly toward the destruction, his eyes intent on the rogue. I'm sorry I took so long in getting to you he said, not taking his eyes off of the rogue. I wanted to make sure your people got out safely. Shibuki nodded to him, thank you for that. He said, shakily getting to his feet, what do we do about him? He asked, gesturing to Haydn as the rogue stepped out of the rubble. I gave him all that I had, and yet he wouldn't stay down. Dureya shook his head, he's a jashinist. An all but immortal being that must make a ritual sacrifice to his deity or else he'll lose the power he's been granted. Jureya explained, I've faced some like him in the past, but never this manic. The best way to deal with him is to make sure he'll never be able to perform his ritual again, that way he'll eventually die. He said, then noticed a wound on Shibuki's shoulder, he didn't do that, did he? Shibuki nodded, he caught me with his scythe during my last attack. He said, why? Because, Haydn cackled as he came back onto the pier, I now have all I need to make my offering to Lord Jashin. Before him was the body of a young shinobi which he kicked aside harshly, revealing a blood circle with a triangle in the center. Jiraiya roared forth, a Rasengan forming in each of his hands, no, you don't, you sick son of a. 
Aiden licked a drop of blood from the tip of his blade. Ah, 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 he said as his skin turned black as pitch and white skeletal markings appeared all over him. Not. One. Step. Closer. He then drove the blade into his stomach. Chibuki thought that, for a moment, the man had committed suicide. But then. Bruh. Blood spurted from his mouth as his stomach was split open, staining the ground red. Bureya skidded to a halt just a few inches from Haydn's face, with the twin Rasengan screaming. Haydn grinned madly as the man snarled at him, furiously grinding his teeth as he looked back at the village leader, holding his stomach. Ah, what a shame, Haydn smiled, looks like I hit an artery, so he'll bleed out pretty fast. Too bad. Shibuki coughed up a large amount of blood, wh what did you do? Shibuki asked weakly, what the hell did you do to me? Haydn laughed as he retracted the blade from his body. This is the power of Lord Jashin, he said, smiling, can you feel that? That glorious pain. The agony. Wonderful isn't it? Bastard. Jurea snarled, let him go. The grin on Haydn's face widened impossibly, now why would I do that? He asked, his tongue hanging out, I've only just begun to enjoy our shared agony. He said, looking down at the circle he was standing in, Oi, dead guy, you wanna know something? He said, gaining Shibuki's attention, I didn't just use the blood of you people for this seal. He swung his scythe over his shoulder, yeah, there are a bunch of little fuckers running around, looking for the bug girl. Shibuki's eyes widened, no. You didn't. I didn't cackled, of course I did. He roared loudly as Jurei paled, those little brats were so easy to kill, it was almost no fun watching them run away from me while I cut them down. Shibuki growled and struggled to his feet, you. You sick, son of a bitch. He roared, bringing his hands away from his wound and clapping his hands together, I don't care if I die, he snarled, blood pouring from his wound as he advanced on him, but if you dare harm the children of my village. His eyes turned bloody red, I'll rip you to pieces. Aiden just laughed, with your spleen hanging out. He taunted, you stupid fucker, if you even touch me, you die with my injuries on you instead. Chibuki snarled at him, I am the leader of the village hidden within the falls. He snapped, forming another hand seal, and as the leader, I have developed my own techniques for using water styles. He said, a shiver running over his body, and over 70% of the human body is made entirely of water, you fool. Ha. Huh? Haydn cocked his head, the fuck are you talking about? Shibuki gave a small smile, Jureya, get clear. Jureya jumped out of the way as Shibuki finished his jutsu, water style. Demon marionette. He cast his hands out, and Haydn felt himself go rigid, the blood freezing in his veins. But the fu his jaw clamped shut, making it impossible to speak. Shibuki smiled at him weakly, I'll have no more of that foul language of yours, he said, and twitched his fingers in a come-hither motion, now, come out of that circle, you monster. Ureya grinned as Haydn took a forced step from the array, forming a Rasengan once again, but this one was quite different. You're not the only one that has some hidden skills, Lord Shibuki. The blue orb began to glow dangerously red, and the screaming sound the ball made shifted into a roar, murdering innocent civilians and children. He said, turning to the advancing Akatsuki, I'll have you burn in the deepest pits of hell. Haydn was panicking by now. In previous encounters, he had seen that technique used only once before, and he knew he wouldn't be able to survive being hit with it. As soon as his feet left the circle, Jureya slammed the blazing orb into him, breaking Shibuki's hold on him and sending him rocketing into the valley walls in a torrent of flames. Fire style. Hellfire Rasengan. Jureya muttered as the Akatsuki was destroyed. Shibuki smiled tiredly as the remains of the monster fell back to the village, my thanks, Lord Jureya, he said as the man came back and knelt beside him as he sank to his knees, I couldn't have held him for much longer. Jureya shook his head, I couldn't have gotten him if it wasn't for your technique. Shibuki shook his head, no, if he hadn't caught me in that strange technique of his, then you wouldn't have had to wait, he said, looking up at the large tree at the center of his village, seeing a large gale of wind shaking leaves away from the branches. Fu must be fighting with the other one. You need to help her. He said, looking back at the sand and please, I'm done for, but Fu still has a chance, he begged and reached into his robes, and please, give this to her. Gureya took with a nod of his head, I will. I promise we'll look after her. The village leader smiled one last time and closed his eyes. The yelp escaped her as she was flung back by the blast of wind that struck her. Her wings were in tatters and her chakra cloak was beginning to fade. Kakuzu stood in front of her, none the worse for wear as he crossed his arms. Is that really all you can do? He asked nonchalantly, sounding almost disappointed. Boo fluttered down to a ruined branch, her breath coming out raggedly, I... I'm not done, yet. Bakuzu chuckled and held out both of his arms, oh, I think you are. He said, smiling underneath his mask, I'll admit that you're quite a bit stronger than most normal shinobi I've fought, but as far as Yinchuriki go. You are pathetic. Boo growled angrily. 
Her skin began to peel away from her body as the shroud began to strengthen. Vu, don't. Chimei cautioned, you're not ready to go that far. I don't have a choice, Chimei. Fu said desperately. Her wings healed themselves, and the girl fluttered once again in front of her ruined cabin. Even if I have to die, I won't let you hurt my friend. Bakuzu tilted his head, friend. He said, and began to laugh, you think that thing in there is your friend? He's a Jinchuriki, like me, Fu snapped as the sickening chakra peel away at her flesh, that's all I need. Bakuzu's laughter continued, you're very naive, and so very wrong, he said, pointing at her cabin, as long as the Akatsuki has been monitoring that brat you're hiding, these last three years, he's been relentless and ruthless. Hell, the bounty on his head is enough to make him an S-rank shinobi. He laughed, and you like to know how he got that bounty. He slaughtered an entire village. Iwafu sank back down to the branch, the cloak failing. Had what he'd said really been true? Fu, don't listen to him. Jimei shouted. He's baiting you. Who looked up at the man, you're lying. He's not a murderer. All shinobi are murderers, you stupid girl, Kakuzu snarled, that is the way it has always been, even a genin is destined to be a killer. He advanced on her, one of his masks sparking with lightning, the world revolves around killing and being killed. In the end, even your own village was planning to murder you at one point in your life, because they would need a new jinchuriki. The only thing you can actually count on in this world is money. Fu felt rage bubbling up in her chest once more as Jamei's chakra began to cover her again, I won't listen to you anymore, she snarled, her wings flaring from her back once again, spreading poisonous power all around her. Bakuzu stepped back from the cloud, the bark of the tree steaming and melting away from its touch. Hmm, seems you're done playing games, aren't you? The roar erupted from the area, but it didn't come from Fu. The Seven Tails Jinchuriki was just as startled as Kakuzu by the sound as it shook the area. Her cabin exploded only a moment later as a miasma of red corrosive chakra swirled around the ruins in a red cyclone of raw power. It was a stifling feeling, but it was nothing compared to what was coming with the chakra. Pure bloodlust. Uh-oh. Chimei chittered, this isn't good. Fu, you need to get away from there. W-H-Y. What's? Roar. The Kuzu trembled for once in his life, that's the nine tails, he growled, frowning under his mask, sweat beginning to beat his brow, damn it, that brat should have been knocking on death's door. The body began to rise from the debris of her ruined home. Instead of the cloaked creature she had expected, the blonde teen had donned his pants and stood in the center of the maelstrom of chakra. His eyes wild and filled with rage. No longer the deep blue hues they had been, they were a bloody red, with black slits for pupils. His hair was a wild mane that was blowing in the wind kicked up by the chakra swirling around him, while his face had darkened, black lines appearing around his eyes, deepening his whisker-like marks. His teeth lengthened to fangs, and his nails sharpened to claws. Naruto no longer looked human, putting even the wild visage of the fabled Inuzuka clan to shame with his frightful appearance. Fu felt afraid of him for the first time since she'd taken him in, as those wild eyes looked from Kakuzu to her for a single second. Kakuzu made the mistake of taking a small step back, snapping a twig in doing so, and alerted the bestial Jinchuriki to him once more. Before the man could blink, Naruto was right in front of him. Not a whisper of a sound. His clawed fist plowed into his abdomen and slammed him into and through the trunk of the tree. As Fu watched him take after the Akatsuki shinobi, she felt relief washing over her. Ch Chimei, what was that? What happened to him? Demei sighed within her mind, he felt threatened by Kakuzu's presence being so near. The seven-tailed beetle explained, with such a monster so close to his vessel, Kurama must have sent his primal instincts into overdrive. She said, he's nothing more than a beast right now. Lightning erupted across the valley, and she saw Naruto being flung down into the lake, Kakuzu following after him. The blonde landed on the surface of the water on all fours, snarling like the beast he contained. Bakuzu stood before him, chuckling, maybe you're worth the effort after all, he said, much to the blonde's growing rage. He formed a hand sign, fire beginning to form at the mouth of his tiger mask. Dead away from him. Fu shouted, landing a flying kick right to his face, sending him crashing into the water. Naruto growled at her as she came near, Naruto, don't, the girl said gently, holding up her hands to show she meant no harm, it's alright, you don't have to fight. The hell he doesn't, Kakuzu growled as he came up for air and pulled himself up onto the surface. Naruto went for him immediately, his claws reared back and swung at him. False darkness. Kakuzu roared and a bolt of lightning shot forth, striking Naruto dead center in the chest. He yelped and fell into the water. Fu yelled in anger and sent another cloud of poison dust toward the man, catching him off guard as the powder landed on him and began melting his flesh away. The girl then went for the recovering blonde as he dragged himself out of the water, his body steaming, and hit him with another cloud, this one meant to put him to sleep. It worked to an extent. 
Naruto was still weakened by the blood loss he had suffered, and the powder went right into his system, knocking him out instantly, his physical features going back to normal. You little bitch. Kakuzu snarled as his body repaired itself slowly, I'll make both of you suffer for this. I wouldn't, Jiraiya's voice reached him. He looked toward the shore and saw the Sanin standing there with his arms crossed and an angry look on his face. His eyes had become golden in color, and his pupils were now shaped like horizontal bars. His face and limbs had also become toad-like, his feet looking webbed from where he stood. Your partner is dead and gone, Kakuzu, and I don't really have the patience to deal with a hundred-year-old miser like you. So here's your choice, leave now and don't ever show your face to me again or else I finish this fight. Kakuzu growled as he took in the sage. He was near exhausted from dealing with the unleashed nine tails in Churiki, though he thought he could have bested him in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but the girl had interfered and now he had the Sanin to worry about. Another time, Kakuzu said, disappearing in a body flicker. The sounds of crickets chirping and the crackling of a fire were what roused him as his eyes opened slowly. He was staring up at the night sky, filled with stars and a soft breeze allowing leaves to drift lazily to the ground. It would have been a welcome evening to see if his body wasn't so damn sore. He grunted, trying to sit himself up, but found it difficult as his body was stiff from lack of movement. His joints popped loudly, telling him he hadn't moved in a while. A chuckle sounded from beside him, causing him to look off to his left to see the fire burning brightly and his master grinning at him. Decided to rejoin the living, have we? The blonde nodded, it feels like I haven't moved for days, he said, looking to the other side, and his eyes went wide. Devastation met his azure gaze as he took in what remained of the village. The stench of blood and burning flesh filled the air, burning his nose and churning his stomach. No. Don't tell me I. Gurea could see the growing anxiety on the boy's face and reached out to place a comforting hand on his shoulder. This wasn't you, son, Jiraiya murmured softly, you did go into the nine-tailed state, but it was the tail estate. We were lucky your little friend was able to put you out before it got worse. Friend? Naruto asked before it began to slowly come back to him. The fall into the gorge and his near drowning. The beautiful girl looking down at him with worry. What happened to her? Gurea jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Not all of the villagers were able to make it out before the Akatsuki showed up to finish what they started. He said somberly, shaking his head, she's been burying them. Naruto scowled at him, you left her to do it alone. He growled, clenching his fists, are you stupid or something? Like I do something like that, Jiraiya growled right back, I offered to help her, but she insisted on doing it herself. Hearing this did nothing to calm the blonde, you said it was the Akatsuki that caused all of this. He said, trying to change the subject, it makes sense. The explosions that went off in those outposts had to have come from somewhere. Bu mentioned Dadara, Jiraiya put in with a frown, he caused the explosions, and then Kakuzu and Haiden moved in to capture you, and Fu if things went their way. Fu. The name rang a bell, and then Naruto smacked his forehead, the girl that rescued me. Jiraiya nodded. A lot's happened, Naruto, he said as the boy sighed tiredly, I offered to take her away from the village, and her village leader, Shibuki, accepted before aiding me in killing Haiden. The immortal. Naruto looked at him in surprise, the last time we fought him, he nearly had us. And now you're saying you killed him. Not without cost, the sage said, Shibuki was caught by that damn technique that maniac used. He didn't last long after killing him. He said, looking down into the fire for a moment, this village had quite a secret hidden away from the world, he said, pulling a scroll from his robe, this will be meant for Fu when she's ready to accept it. He looked off into the ruined village, but right now, I doubt she's up for anything. Naruto followed his gaze and stood up, I need to talk to her. Her hands ached from so much use as she sat in front of the freshly filled graves. Dirt and grime covered her fingers, almost making it impossible to see her fingernails. She had no incense to burn, nor did she have any flowers to give. Only her prayers that her people were at peace. This wasn't your fault, little one. Chimei spoke out in her mind, making the girl tremble as sobs began to racking her chest, none of it was. Who buried her face in her knees, if I'd been faster, then maybe Shibuki would. This is my fault, a voice said, startling her into standing. She whipped around at the slightly familiar voice, half ready for a fight, only to find the form of a shirtless blonde standing behind her. Naruto looked absolutely miserable as he surveyed the graveyard. I can't even begin to say how sorry I am for this. How many died because you saved my life? Who, shaking off her surprise, frowned, this wasn't your doing. She said, crossing her arms loosely, Lord Jurea explained it to me, so even if I hadn't saved you from drowning, they would have come after me eventually. Still, if I'd been allowed to die, it would have ruined their plans, Naruto pointed out, shocking her. The maid chittered in agitation, the boy wants to die. Fu silently agreed with what she was saying, as the words of Kakuzu came back to her. Now they were making sense to her. 
She herself had been subject to it when she was just learning how to control her tailed beast's chakra, before having met the overly friendly Chimay face to face and had gone wild with the power, killing more than just a few people in her berserk state. Bakuzu's claim about Naruto slaughtering an entire village may have had some truth to it. How many people did you kill? She found herself asking, making the blonde snap his head up. Naruto's shock lasted all but a minute, however, as he refused to meet her gaze. Twenty men and women, and at least fourteen children. I couldn't tell. Because of how shredded the bodies were. Boo gulped back the bile that rose in her throat upon hearing him. She loved children more than anything, and hearing that he'd killed so many, whether he was conscious of it or not, horrified her. But she managed to hold her tongue. Saying anything would be hypocritical at that point. How did it happen? Naruto shook his head, I'm not sure. He admitted shamefully, during my first year under the old man's training, he loosened my seal so that I could access more of. That chakra, he said, spitting the word out in resentment, when he did that, it was almost like a flood. And all I remember seeing was red and nothing else until I wore myself out and found Jure is sitting in front of me with a huge wound on his chest. And he asked my if I truly didn't remember anything that had just happened. I was the same when I learned about Jamei, she said, thinking back on the mishap, four full squads were killed when they tried to subdue me. Shibuki told me that it would have been best if they just let me run myself down, but they insisted on going after me against his orders. Naruto shook his head, it's different with me, Fu, the blonde said, looking down at his hands, I may not be able to remember what happened while I was going berserk. But the fox did. Inside her seal, Jamei hissed angrily. That bastard, Kurama. The beetle snarled, shocking Fu with her anger, he showed him everything that happened while he was out of control. Before she could comment, however, Naruto continued. I saw everything, he muttered, confirming the seven tail suspicions as his hands beginning to shake, from the moment I attacked and nearly killed Jiraiya, to the first last person I killed, he said, and clenched his tightly, making his knuckles groan, I know you can't see it, but every time I look at them. I see my hands covered in the blood of all of those people. I was covered in it. Naruto Fu reached out, but he recoiled from her touch. I scrubbed my skin raw trying to get it off, but it's still there. He said, shaking his head, I can't see it anymore. But I can smell it. I can still hear their screams as I killed them. He began to shiver uncontrollably, the looks on their faces. The taste of their blood. It's never going to go away, he said, looking over the freshly dug graves, and now I've brought it to your village. How can you say that it's not my fault that all of these people are dead? Fu, surprising the blonde with her quick movements, rushed forward and wrapped her arms around him, not caring that he was shirtless, and clasped her hands behind his back in a tight embrace. It was more than a little surprising to the blonde shinobi, because the girl leaning against him felt so much smaller than she seemed only moments ago as she clung to him. It's not your fault, the girl whispered against his chest, ignoring the burning heat in her cheeks, none of it. Using the chakra of a tailed beast is always risky. Using too much too soon can drive you into a mindless frenzy, whether or not your beast wants you to or not. She said, Chimay chittering in agreement within her seal as the blonde began to gently wrap his arms around her, making Fu's blush deepen. The fox is just trying to hurt you by making you feel guilty about what happened. Naruto bit his lip, not trusting himself to speak at the moment. Fu felt warmer to him than even the sun as he held her close to him, feeling the thrumming beat of her heart against his chest. For a moment, his guilt lifted, finding himself believing her words. She's going to die growled a voice in the back of his mind, making him stiffen, you know she will. If she's around you, you lose control again, just like last time, and it will be. All. Your. Fault. Be quiet. Naruto roared angrily through his mind, you won't get the better of me again, because I'm never using your damn chakra ever again. Laughter echoed throughout the confines of his mind as the image of Bardgate appeared with two bright red eyes behind them, with a malicious smile, showed rows of jagged teeth. You know that you need my power, you loathsome runt the fox smiled, even as Naruto's hold on the girl never lessened, yes, you have grown quite powerful in these last few years, but do you believe it will be enough to defeat the Akatsuki? The hole in your side says otherwise, does it not? And however will you retrieve your friend from that snake, Orochimaru? The laughter continued, becoming louder with each passing moment, because when last you two fought, you did, indeed, use my power, twice, yet you still lost, even though you had him dead to rights. Face it, you runt, you are nothing without my power. Before Naruto could retort, a loud buzzing was heard. Almost like the sound of wings. The next thing that the blonde knew, both he and Fu, still in his arms, were relocated to the inner workings of the seal on Naruto's stomach. The fox was just as surprised as the two teens as Fu looked around in confusion, yelping as she caught sight of the monstrous red eyes behind the bars. The loud thump sounded behind them, and Naruto was shocked to see a gigantic rhinoceros beetle sitting behind them. What the? The Mei Fu gaped, what are you? 
The loud crash nearly knocked the pair off of their feet as the fox slammed his clawed hands against the bars, roaring angrily, you're not welcome here, seven tails. The May sighed, settling herself down on her stomach, oh, Karama, 500 years of not seeing each other, and you demand that I leave right away. She tutted, shaking her massive head, such a horrible, bothersome brother you are, Karama. Karama. Naruto said, looking between the two beasts. Do not use my name without my permission, you wretch human. Karama roared, rattling the entire room with his fury. And do not throw my name about, Chimei. No human has the right to use it, nor will they ever. The Mei chattered loudly in laughter, her wings vibrating. Now, now, Karama, no need to be so hostile, she said, looking down at the two Jinchuriki in between the two massive beasts. You will stop your tormenting of this child, Karama. She said, her voice offering no room for an argument. Karama just snarled from behind the bars, scraping his claws against the metal with a screech, and if I don't. The massive fox asked, sneering down at the blonde, what can you do to stop me, little sister? You have your own vessel to deal with, do you not? As far as I can see, you really have no way to hinder me in my fun. The maid growled angrily, but kept her temper in check. Making others angry was a favorite pastime of her brother's. Falling for it now would do nothing but amuse him. Do not test me, my brother, Jamei warned him, making the fox growl as she looked down at the blonde and her little hornet, and then back at the crimson fox, am I to really understand that you have lowered yourself to Shikaku's level? Karama growled at the mention of the one-tailed tanuki residing in Suna. Naruto looked up at the fox as the low, rumbling growl began, and, knowing what was coming, took Fu out of the way just in time for not a second later, Karama's toothy maw opened in a titanic roar, sending a shock wave through the seal. Chimei was largely unaffected by the blast, but the two humans could barely hear anything other than the monster sound of Karama's fury. You dare to compare me to that loathsome fool Karama snarled, only for the beetle to start chattering out a laugh. As I see it, you have started affecting Yujin Chiriki with visions of atrocities, she said, flaring her wings out in a display of rainbow colors, hear my words, brother, because, so help me, should you continue your torment of this boy, I will tell him of your greatest weakness. Naruto's brow rose as he turned and looked at the fox, whose eyes had narrowed, our greatest weakness, Karama growled, and you cannot possibly teach him, for mastering the art is lost to all. The all but we nine, Jamei snapped her wings closed, true, it is a lost art, but all things can be rediscovered, even by humans. She said, taking a few scuttling steps forward, the boy is strong, Karama, never doubt that. I sense in him a great power that I have not seen since our father's time. If you push him, you will regret it. The giants were quiet for a long moment, both waiting for the other to break. Between Naruto and Fu, it was the first time they had seen their respective beast so intensely focused, let alone within the seal of another beast for the latter. Naruto, however, was more interested in what Jamei had said. The tailed beasts have a weakness. He thought, frowning. The nine beasts were supposed to be virtually unstoppable, with nothing short of a powerful sealing array, being able to put a stop to a rampage, should one of them get loose. In his time under Jiraiya's tutelage, the young shinobi had come to respect the Nine Tails, no, Kurama's powerful chakra. It was what had first led to him saying yes to learning how to control it better. Which is what led to the incident. Now he was afraid to even attempt drawing on a small amount of it for fear of losing control again. Finally, Kurama broke the silence, fine, the fox growled, laying down behind the bars and crossing his paws, laying his head down to rest, now, get out. You have long worn out your welcome. Do not force yourself into my prison again, else your Jinchuriki will suffer. Don't you dare touch her. Both tailed beasts turned their attention to the furious blonde as he roared. Karama huffed in amusement. My warning still stands, you pathetic meat sack, the fox grinned widely, showing off all of his teeth, dream of that day, Naruto. Dream of the day when you have no other choice but to use my power and are unable to handle it. How many will? The Mei flared her wings out again, Karama. The dark laughter of the fox haunted the blonde as the seal began to fade away. Naruto and Fu soon found them standing back in the freshly dug graveyard, still in clinging to each other. Ch Shimei. The seven tails didn't answer, apparently too agitated to speak. Naruto on the other hand, was a little more shaken than the girl. A loss of control was a very real fear for him. Recovering from the sudden meeting, Fu realized that she was still holding on to the handsome, shirtless blonde. But the quiet squeak, the girl stepped out of his arms, a small blush on her cheeks. I um, sorry about. Whatever that was. She said, feeling like a fool for stuttering so badly, now I can see why Jamei thinks he's such a jerk. She said, trying to lighten the mood, Karama is horrible. Naruto looked at her, and then down at the ground, I I never knew he had a name. Naruto admitted, feeling somewhat guilty. All of the time he had known the beast, he had never even thought of asking for his name. 
It was not unlike how the villagers had whispered about him behind his back, never using his name, only ever referring to him as that boy dot. Boo gave him a small smile, Jamei told me that most of her siblings are guarded about their names because most of them don't really trust people, she said, frowning, really, I don't blame them. But Karama shouldn't have been tormenting you like that. It wasn't your fault, nor was it his own doing. Before Naruto could respond, Jiraiya made his presence known by coming over to the pair, sorry to interrupt, but I think it's time to move out. The old sage said, jerking his thumb over his shoulder, I can sense quite a few chakra signatures coming this way, and I'm willing to bet that they're from the mist village. If they find Fu alive, then we'll be in for a fight. No way will they let her leave with Leaf Shinobi like us when we have the Nine Tails. Hell, they might even try to take both of you. He said, looking between the pair, Fu looking worried, and Naruto looking. Tired. Naruto, I know you're still winded, but do you think? Naruto nodded, I can take us out of here, he said, but I'll take us there, not the village. He jerked his head toward the west. Ureya frowned, are you sure you can make a jump like that? The boy nodded while the girl looked confused, jump? What are you talking about? Fu asked, and how are we going to get out of the valley without being seen? Naruto's answer was to place an arm around her, causing a small blush to come back to her face, as Jiraiya came over and took hold of his shoulder, hang on tight, he said quietly, concentrating his chakra as it flared back to life through his system, I don't want to lose you. Before the embarrassed girl could respond, she felt herself being pulled by the blonde, as if he were falling somewhere, and was taking her with him. It was frightening, if she wasn't being held so tightly, she was sure she would have been lost to the black void her world had become for all of a few seconds. And then she felt her feet touching the ground again. Long blades of grass brushed against the skin of her legs as a soft breeze whispered around them. On was the ruined village she had grown up in, now replaced by a valley, surrounded by high mountains, the highest peaks she had ever seen in her life. Below those snow-capped peaks was a massive lake glistening in the moonlight, fed by the melting snow from those mountains. There were very few trees, nor were they at all very big. Most were fruit trees, if her sense of smell was anything to go on, because she could smell the sweet scent of apple blossoms and persimmons. Naruto released her, are you okay? He asked, taking in her shocked expression, sorry, I should have warned you. It's a little jarring the first time around. Where? The girl breathed out, gasping as she caught sight of a small house near the edge of the lake. It was an old, Shinto-style house, kept in good repair by strong, gentle hands, even the rice paper on the sliding doors looked new. This place is. So beautiful. She said, turning to the two men, where are we? I've never seen a place like this in my entire life. Ureya chuckled, smiling at his new charge, this, my dear girl, is our home far away from home, he said as he began to lead her toward the house, welcome, Fu, to the land of ancestors. The house, to Fu's delight, was already fully stocked with everything needed to host more than one person. She watched Naruto and Jiraiya go about pulling out storage scroll after storage scroll, producing some spare clothes for Naruto, furniture, including a kitchen table and a wood stove to cook a meal for the three of them. Jiraiya cooked a simple meal of curry and rice, but the girl found it delicious either way. Naruto himself found his spirits lifting as the girl marveled at the house and all that it had to offer. As Jiraiya set about getting their rooms ready, the young blonde followed Fu down to the lake, watching her dip her toes into the water. Do you like it here? He asked, smiling as the girl turned and beamed at him, her arms tucked behind her back. It's wonderful, she said, smiling widely, I always heard that the land of ancestors was a barren wasteland. But this place is. I don't know, she said, turning about to look out across the lake, it feels so pure. Like it's been untouched. It has, Naruto said, stepping up next to her, letting the cool waters soothe his feet, we came out here to work on my training after. My accident, he said, touching his stomach, and Fu immediately understood, we expected to find it barren, too, but it was just the opposite. We built our house in just a few months, and trained to our heart's content, day in and day out, until we were sure we're broken every one bone in our bodies. He said, smiling fondly at some of the mishaps that they had gotten into, we'd take a few missions every now and then to keep food on the table or to buy more gear, but most of our time was spent here, so. So you wouldn't hurt anyone, Fu said, nodding and understanding. Turning to look at him, she blushed at the way the moonlight seemed to enhance his features and made his eyes shine like sapphires. Uh, Naruto. He turned to her, smiling tiredly, you know. I'm grateful to you. For what? Naruto asked, surprised. Seems like I've been nothing but a plague since I made you. Fu shook her head, you haven't, she admitted, sure, bad things happened, but we're shinobi, and things in our lives turn out to be perfect. She said, looking up at him, but since you came into my life, I've stood up for myself against my village, and I even got my freedom. All thanks to you and Lord Jiraiya. But you lost everyone that you loved, Naruto pointed out, looking down in disgust, that's far too much of a price to pay for freedom. 
Maybe, Fu nodded, but my people didn't die for me, Naruto. They died defending their people. The only person that ever treated me like a normal everyday girl was Shibuki, and I loved him like a father, just as he loved me as a daughter. When I lost him, my life in Waterfall was really over. Nothing could have kept me there if he wasn't around. She said, looking at the lake once more, I was alone all of the time because he was always busy as the village leader, and I could never just go down into the village to do anything, because everyone was too afraid of me to even let me near them without panicking. I was the same, Naruto said, nodding, I was utterly hated for being Kurama's in Churiki, but I never knew why. I just thought people hated me for no reason. I was never hurt, but being ignored all of my life was so hard that sometimes I thought of just leaving. Why didn't you? She asked. Naruto shrugged, something old man Hokage told me when I was a kid, he said, remembering the words of his grandfather figure, he told me that when gemstones first come out of the ground, they're rough and not worth much, so they have to be cut and polished so that they can shine with their true worth. He said I was like that. All that I needed was to be cut and polished a little, and he was sure that I would make in splendid shinobi. Who smiled at him, well, if that technique you used to get us here was anything to go on, then I'm willing to bet you're worth more than every sapphire in the world. She said, causing the blonde to look at her strangely. Sapphires? Who blushed slightly, well, your eyes kind of look like them. Or so I'm told, I've never seen one. Naruto just grinned, thanks, Fu, he said, thanks for saving me. Both times. He turned back toward the house, we should probably turn in, it's been a long day. He said, starting out with Fu trailing behind him. He turned and looked over his shoulder, your eyes. Are like topaz, I think, or agate. Either way. I think they're beautiful, you know. Fu blushed at the compliment, happy that his back was to her so he wouldn't see it. Though she distinctly heard the laughter of her friend and tenant. From the house, Jureus stood by one of the windows, watching the pair coming back, smiling. I think I finally did something right, Minato. Tsunade Senju had very few things she truly enjoyed in her life that didn't involve gambling or a fine bottle of sake. One of those things, however, just so happened to be the, the king-size bed she had been gifted by her surrogate grandchild, one Naruto Uzumaki. He seemed to know that she would appreciate the gift of a good night's sleep more than anything after a good drink. It was extremely soft, comparable to a cloud, and she had no trouble whatsoever about falling asleep as soon as she found a comfortable position, i.e. as soon as she hit the pillows. Being awakened, however, was one of the fastest ways to make damn sure that she would not be having a good day at all. And by the sound of the pounding upon her door, it was not going to be a good day. No one would dare wake her so early in the morning unless it were urgent, had a death wish, or both. It was usually an Anbu Black Ops shinobi doing the knocking. Sitting up in bed with a groan, the blonde Hokage reached for her robe and flung it around herself before going down to the door, ready to flatten whoever was there unless they had a good reason for knocking so early. Her suspicions were correct, she soon found out, as she flung the door open to find none other than Kakashi Haddock himself, identified only by the dog mask he wore. Forgive me for waking you so early, Lady Hokage, Kakashi said with a slight bow of his head, but we've just received word about the waterfall village being attacked. Tsunade raised her brow, what does it matter to us? She asked, fearing the answer, for she knew that waterfall played host to a Jinchuriki just like Naruto. It was attacked and destroyed by the Akatsuki, Kakashi said, confirming her suspicions, they're getting bolder, my lady. Only a handful of people managed to get out and meet up with a patrol from the Mist Village. When they arrived, they found freshly dug graves, but the Jinchuriki was nowhere to be found. The grim frown marred her face as she sighed, then they got her. The Kakashi shook his head and produced a scroll from his vest, no, Lady Hokage, she's with Jureya. He said, surprising her as she accepted the scroll, he gave a small note saying that he was in the company of the Seven Tails Jinchuriki and that her name was Fu. He also stated that she was now under our care and that we were to make a place for her. Quite demanding for a man that isn't even here, Sune griped, taking the scroll and unrolling it. She began to read its contents, her eyes widening with each word she took in. Do you know what this says, Kakashi? Kakashi nodded, I do. Tsunade smiled slightly, I'm not surprised, she admitted, he was your student, after all. She said, rolling the scroll back up and placing it inside her robes, Jurei is all but demanding that I make him a jonin when he is still just a genin. He does have the experience, now, Kakashi admitted, smiling behind his mask, I believe he's ready. We'll see, Tsunade smiled, they'll be here some time today. What I want you to do is make sure that a genin team is available for the test. Konohamaru's team will do. I believe he's just doing local D ranks right now. He is, the mask shinobi nodded, who is he to be up against? Tsunade gave the man a frightening smile, yourself, Guy, and Asuma Suratobi. Akashi was quite surprised, are you sure that's a good idea? He asked in concern, Naruto can handle himself, but the little ones might. 
Tsunade held up a hand to quiet him, this will be not only a test to see if he's a capable shinobi, Kakashi, but also to see if he's a capable leader. She said, smiling at the thought of what was to come. She was sure that Naruto would put up quite the fight, but seeing him trying to lead a genin team against a trio of veteran shinobi was going to be a sight to see. Bingo book reports aside, she was picturing the lovable blonde knucklehead she had grown to love like a member of her own family. She, of course, had high hopes for him, but she didn't believe he was ready to be a leader, at least, not yet. Still, if he did well enough against the three jonin she had selected, then she could at least promote him to Chunin before someone on the council tried to stop her or convince her otherwise. As she closed the door on the jonin, she couldn't help but think about what Jureya's final words had been in the scroll. Don't push Naruto too far. She could only guess as to what that could mean. Naturally she thought about the Nine Tails. Was he warning her not to push him to using its chakra? Or was T something else? The last few years had been quiet without Naruto round, and with barely any words from the pair, she only knew what she did through the bingo books. Naruto was wanted by Iwa for slaughtering a village of civilians and was placed under a hefty price of 20 billion ryo. When she had first heard of the incident, she thought it was just a rumor kicked up by Iwa to get at their Jinchuriki, but the bounty was set by Inoki the fence-sitter himself, and she knew that he wouldn't cause a stir unless he had a valid reason. Then a real stink had arisen. The elders had found out about it, with none other than Danzo Shimura at the head of the three former shinobi, practically frothing at the mouth to bring the boy back to the village double-quick in order to keep him safe from other villages. Tsunade had squashed the idea at once, seeing as Jureya would never allow it. Oh, he would say that he would be on his way back, but would be undoubtedly delayed. Either by taking an extra long detour or getting held up doing research on something that would undoubtedly take the entire amount of time allotted for Naruto's training. As of right there and then, she knew next to nothing about who Naruto had become. She shivered, the thought of Naruto becoming a mirror image of Jureya frightening her to no end. Dawn was just breaking over the peak surrounding the valley as light streamed in through the window. The bliss of sleep was soon taken from the figure curled up on the futon mattress, a mop of green hair sticking out in different directions as the girl began to wake. She rolled over in an attempt to fall back asleep, but found herself blocked by a something warm. She reached out blindly, trying to figure out just what it was she had bumped into when the object of her curiosity moved. Stop tickling me, a sleepy voice lured. Boo's eyes came open widely. The blush on her cheeks would have been bright enough to light up the land of fire if needed as she found herself fondling the naked abdomen of the sleeping blonde next to her. In the back of her mind she could hear Jamei laughing, well, that's rather bold of you, my little hornet. The tailed beast chattered, her wings buzzing, though I dare say that he is a fine specimen if those stones under your fingers are actually his muscles. Giving a small squeak, Fu pulled her hand back and hid under the covers. Why am I even in the same room? You crawled in with him because you were cold Jamei explained, you should really be thankful that it wasn't Jurea's room you wandered into, because I have heard he's rather loose around young beauties. Jamei. Suddenly she felt a pair of strong arms wrapping around her. Wh Wa Fu squeaked as Naruto curled up against her, sighing in his sleep. Fu's face burned when her head popped up out of the blankets and came face to face with the blonde. Uh, and Naruto. He didn't answer, opting to remain asleep. Fu bit her lip and tried to worm her way out of his grasp, but the blonde held her tightly. It wasn't uncomfortable, far from it. But it was extremely embarrassing. What was he going to think when he actually woke up and found her in bed with him? Don't forget that you tend to wriggle out of your clothes at night, my little glowworm. Jamea reminded her with a chuckle. Fu nearly erupted like a volcano when she realized she was right. The girl did tend to roll and wiggle while she slept, more often than not relieving herself of her clothes in the process. Hesitantly, she peeked under the covers. No. Sure enough, Fu was topless. Demay's laughter surely would have woken the dead if she could be heard outside of her seal. Thankfully, that was impossible. Fu frantically looked around for her top and found more than a few feet away from where they lay. She wriggled beneath the blankets and out of his grasp low enough to slowly reach out and draw the article of clothing to her from beneath the protection of the blankets and snatched it up. She then crawled out from under them and out of the blonde's reach. As she stood and crept out of the room, she looked back at the man, rolling onto his back, still fast asleep. She crept back over and covered him with the blanket and hurriedly moved out. She leaned against the wall for support as she closed the door behind her. That was way too close, she mumbled to herself. It could have been worse Jamei commented, you've woken up naked more than once, you know. Fu groaned as she moved down the hall and outside. The moment she was out the door, the crisp morning air hit her like a brick wall. It was so much fresher than what she knew. It was almost like she was taking her first breath. The air was thick and rich with something she couldn't place and found it almost intoxicating. 
It's natural chakra, Fuchime said, confusing the girl, it is an external energy source that flows around us like an unseen river. The seven tails explained, her voice sounding awestruck, but there's so much of it here that even I can feel it. And the fact that you can feel it, even though you've never been exposed to it before, shows just how pure this place is. is. It's beautiful, Fu commented out loud as she breathed in deeply. She let her wings sprout from her lower back and fluttered up from the ground. For the first time it fully hit her. Her village was gone. The one person she could call a loved one was gone. Saddened though she was, the feeling of being out in the open sky, no trees, no eyes glaring up at her, and no one watching her to make sure she was trying to sneak away. She was free. She flew up higher and higher, above the valley, and high above the mountains, until she could reach out and touch the clouds. She had never flown so high before. She had never been allowed. She looped back over and dove down towards the lake. The spray she kicked up from the surface of the water as she flew over it was ice cold, but she didn't care as she sped along. Her flight spooked a school of fish into jumping out the water, and to her surprise, flew along with her. She giggled at the absurdity at being joined in flight by fish, but they spread out long wing-like fins and glided along for a short distance before diving back into the waters. Larger shapes could be seen beneath the pristine lake, and she wondered just what beneath the water for such a large lake could indeed host a large amount of fish and other life. She made a sharp turn, zipping back toward the house, and, feeling a bit bold, dropped into the water just before she reached land. She came back up with a sputtering scream, giggling wildly as she paddled back to shore, shaking herself dry. She was greeted by the smiling face of Jurea as the man came out of the house to find the girl. Enjoying yourself. Who nodded happily, it's incredible, she breathed out, looking back out over the lake, I never knew that there were fish that could fly, and this place feels so incredibly pure. I think Jamei called it natural chakra. Jurea nodded, Naruto and I both trained to use natural chakra as senjutsu. He said, smiling, it's difficult to master, but Naruto did it far faster than anyone before me, even our first tokage. You mean both of you are sages? Fu asked brightly, but I thought sages were supposed to be really old monks, or hermits. Ureya laughed at her question, well, I am old, especially for a shinobi, he admitted, but mastering sage arts takes discipline more than anything. And patience. Naruto nearly blew his top more than once because he couldn't get it within a week. He had bruises all over him from getting whacked by Lord Fukasaku, and that did nothing to help his temper. Fu giggled. The Naruto she had come to know up unto this moment had been calm and understanding, but to think that he had a temper underneath it all. Although, she shouldn't have been surprised. Everyone had their limits. Even her, having reached those limits only a day prior. And Naruto had come to her defense in front of his tailed beast, a brave thing to do, considering the nine tails had been relentlessly tormenting him. Where is he? She found herself asking, is he up, yet? Ureya snickered and pointed over her shoulder. Fu cocked her head curiously and looked behind her. At first, there was nothing, just an empty space leading out into the valley. But then she heard a small chuckle, and the air shifted just in front of her, as the blonde in question shimmered into side only feet from her, a lopsided grin appearing on his face. Startled, Fu yelped and jumped away from him much to his amusement. Good morning, Fu. He said, smiling as the girl glared at him. Don't scare me. Fu groused, crossing her arms and stamping her foot. Watching the pair, Jiraiya gave a hoot of laughter and clapped his hands together, Naruto, I know you probably don't want to leave, yet, but we should probably get back to the village. Naruto looked at him for a moment, his gaze falling. Oh, it's not all that bad. The elder sage said, trying to ease his worries, besides, I've sent word to Tsunade. She's supposedly setting up a test to promote you to Jonin if you pass. Naruto did perk up at this and sighed, looking at the girl beside him, well, it looks like our time here is up, he said, giving that crooked smile of his again, that suddenly made her heart skip a beat. Are you feeling up to another jump? Boo, blushing a bit, tucked her arms behind her back, promise not to let me go. Naruto laughed and jerked his thumb over at Jiraiya, if I was going to do that, I would have dropped the old man the minute I learned the flying raging. Jiraiya harumphed, you did drop me once, when you were learning it, he growled, I never should to let you talk me into helping you. I ended up north of the cloud village, and you landed somewhere in hot water. Boo gaped at him, and then looked at the blonde, you know, I think I'll just fly there, she said, backing away from them as Jurea snuck behind her, and loop his arms under hers, ah really, it shouldn't take me more than a few hours if I really book it. Jurea chuckled, sorry, missy, but you'll have to put up with it, he grinned, and Naruto reached out and took hold of her shoulder, besides, he hasn't dropped anyone in ages. And I'd never let you go, Naruto promised. Who blushed, damn that stupid crooked smile of his. She all but squealed internally as Jamei cackled. Oh, hush. Here we go, she heard Naruto say, and looked up to see him smiling down at her again, just close your eyes, and it'll be over. 
She did as she was instructed, closing her eyes tightly as she felt the moment of vertigo hit her once again. I really don't like this feeling she thought as she reached out instinctively and clung to Naruto, it feels way too much like falling. The fall felt longer than before. Possibly because they were far from their destination, which made her cling to him all the tighter. He placed his arm around her at some point, holding her in place. And finally, after what seemed like forever, her feet touched the ground again. Wow, they added Granny's face to the monument, she heard Naruto say, that's a big change. Who opened her eyes and found herself standing in the middle of a busy little street in the middle of what looked to be a bustling village. Of course, with the sudden appearance of the trio, all business and bypassers had stopped to stare. Mainly at the tall blonde clad in a black shirt, orange pants, and a red cloak edged in black flames over his shoulders. She didn't know why she hadn't noticed his attire earlier, but the cloak was rather intimidating, the kanji for oil stitched into the back with black thread. The looks he was getting were mixed. Some looked at him with confusion, not knowing who this stranger was, even though he looked familiar. Others did realize who he was and looked at him with fear and loathing. But one reaction Fu would remember. The boy, no older than 12 or 13, and trailing a long blue scarf, came running up to the blonde and tackled him. Naruto laughed loudly and tossed the boy into the air, while two more children ran up to him, another little boy with glasses, and a little girl with her hair done up in pigtails, and a perpetual blush on her cheeks. Look at you all. Naruto laughed as he hoisted all of them onto his shoulders, you've all grown up into real shinobi. You bet. The first boy crowed happily, it's great to see you again, big brother. Naruto. Fu looked to see another new arrival, this one a girl that looked to be Naruto's age, with bright pink hair coming toward them. She had a huge smile on her face as she saw the blonde holding the three genin. You're finally back. She said as she came to a stop. Naruto smiled at the rosette, it's good to see you again, Sakura. He said, and Fu felt a small spike of jealously hit her. It was clear that they knew each other, of course they did. She was probably his teammate, or at least a close friend. Hold on, Sakura stepped back, holding a hand above her head, you're taller than me now, aren't you? Naruto grinned that grin of his, what? Did you think I'd stay the runt of the team forever? He asked with a grin as he set the genin down, you've grown, too, he said, looking her up and down, I can tell you've grown a lot stronger. Sakura blushed with pride, well, don't you think I've grown more womanly, too? Are you kidding you're flatter than I am? Fu wanted to shout, but held herself back for her friend's sake. The maid chittered with laughter, she does have nice legs. Oh, whose side are you on? Fu asked while something Naruto said seemed to upset the rosette while she was wilgathering. Meanwhile, Poof. A puff of smoke signifying a transformation revealed a naked woman. Well, how do you like my jutsu? The mist surrounded beauty asked. 10. Jiraiya roared, giving a double thumbs up as the jutsu was undone, revealing the boy wearing the blue scarf again. The boy grinned and placed his hands behind his head, pretty impressive in the curves department, huh, bro. But rather than seeing a pleased expression on the blonde's face, it was a sad tired smile. Uh, Naruto, did I do something wrong? Naruto shook his head and patted the boy on the head, no, I'm just surprised you're still using that old trick of mine, as all. Who blinked, his trick. He used to use that on Konohamaru's grandfather all the time, the girl said, smiling, it always worked, too. Sakura crossed her arms, pervert. Naruto ignore her, how's your Rasengan? He asked the boy. Konohamaru pouted, I still can't do it with one hand. He admitted bashfully, I still need shadow clones to do it right, or else it backfires on me. Naruto grinned, don't worry, he said, smiling widely, I'm back now, and I'll be sure to teach you properly. He turned and looked to Jiraiya, let's go see Granny. Maybe I can take over as their sensei if I pass her test. A knock on the door of her office alerted Tsune to her newest guests. Come in. She called out, and the door swung open to reveal the people she had been waiting for. Jiraiya entered first, grinning away as he saw the woman of his affections after so long. Behind him walked Naruto, no longer the runt she had known him to be. He stood taller than herself now, rivaling his father in height. Dawn was the baby fat around his face, giving way to a slightly leaner look, though she could see just a hint of the roundness in his face that was all of his mother's genes. Next to the blonde were the three genin she had called for, obviously not knowing why they had been summoned now of all times. Behind them trailed her apprentice, smiling happily at her teacher. Lastly, but not least, came a thin slip of a girl. Tsunade had to raise her brow at her. She was lovely, of course, as most if not all Kinoichi were, but she was far more exotic than she was expecting with such dark skin and the mint-colored hair. Upon entering the room, she noticed that the girl's eyes darted all around, as if looking for an escape route, should the need arise. Just from looking at the girl's shoulders she could tell that the poor thing was close to fleeing from nervousness. Hey there, Granny, Naruto smiled slightly, giving a half-hearted salute as tick mark appeared on the woman's forehead. 
She should have known better than to think that he'd ever stop calling her that. No, he showed more affection with his insults, she knew that, but God. Would it kill the brat to have a little respect? Naruto. The mint-haired girl hissed, catching the blonde's attention, you shouldn't talk to the hokage like that. It's disrespectful. She gave him a light tap on the shoulder with her fist, which made the blonde wince and groan in mock pain. Fu, however, freaked out. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I forgot you were still healing. Naruto straightened up from his hunched-over posture and grinned, you're too easy to tease, you know. He asked, lifting up his shirt to show his side, the only thing visible on his skin was a blemish of scar tissue from a massive injury. I healed completely last night. Wafu turned beet red and pouted, oh, you. I thought I told you not to tease me. Naruto chuckled and replaced his shirt, no, you told me not to scare you, he pointed out, much to her indignation, there's a very big difference. Tsunade almost laughed at the light-hearted banter between the two, but the look on Jiraiya's face as he too watched the pair stopped her in her tracks. Jiraiya was looking at the blonde shinobi in abject shock. As if he had never seen the sight of Naruto before now, even though the Naruto they both knew was the worst kind of prankster out there. The kind that didn't care who he got, as long as he got a laugh out of it. Who crossed her arms and turned away from him, her cheek puffed out in display that the blonde thought was cute for a moment before he banished those thoughts. He wouldn't think of fool like that. Fortunately, Tsune chose then to clear her throat, if you two lovebirds are finished, she said, taking note of the slight blush on Naruto's cheeks, as well as the prominent one on Fu's. It's good to finally see you again, brat, she said, too bad I can't keep calling you a shrimp, but I have to say, you look a lot more mature now. Naruto jerked his thumb over at the white-haired man, try living with this old pervert for two and a half years and staying a kid, he said, giving his sensei a small look which Jiraiya matched, his crossing his arms against his chest. But I think it's mission accomplished, granny, he said, smiling a little at the cage, I've grown a lot stronger since I left. So I've heard, she said, raising a black book from her desk drawer and slapping it down in front of her, care to explain. Jiraiya visibly winced, clenching his teeth, too far, already. He thought as the blonde's gaze grew cold and hard, surprising Tsunade far more than his bingo book record, because the temperature in the room seemed to drop so rapidly that she swore that could see her breath. You've read it, so you already know, he said, looking down at the young genin, and they're still too young to know, and I'm not ready to tell them. Tsunade frowned for a moment, ignoring the coldness her fellow blonde was putting out, and sighed, fair enough, she said, and turned her attention to the tag along. You must be Fu, am I right? Who jumped, giving out a squeak, why yes, ma'am, er, Lady Hokage. Tsunade chuckled, no need to be so nervous, she assured her with a wave of her hand, I'm not as horrible as Naruto or Jiraiya have most likely told you. Who shook her head slightly, um, they haven't said anything about you. Not really, she mumbled quietly. In truth, neither had said much of anything about their village leader, only that she was who she was, and that was only in passing. Tsunade didn't seem offended as the woman just smiled, well, even if they haven't, I'm sure you've heard plenty about me. As the village's hokage, it's my duty to place you where I think. She stays with me, Naruto interrupted, his gaze having remained hard and cold, it's not up for discussion. Tsunade did get offended then and scowled at the young shinobi, now, see here, Naruto. Naruto stepped forward and slammed his right fist down onto her desk, splintering the wood beneath his knuckles. As the pieces of wood flew up from the impact, Tsunade noticed that the skin beneath his wrist, encompassing his knuckles and fingers, was black and gave off a slight sheen under the light. No, the blonde shinobi said evenly, his voice deadly calm, her entire village was slaughtered, her only friend died taking down a man that nearly killed me twice since I'd met the prick, and she spent all of yesterday burying her people alone, he growled, his eyes flashing golden for a moment. You can bust me back to an academy student for all I care, but you won't be forcing Fu anywhere else, unless she wants to go. The frown on Tsunade's face deepened as she clenched her fingers together tightly, and how is it that you get to decide where I put her? Because if I hadn't drifted into her village in the first place, Naruto growled, all of those people would still be alive. It's my fault that. He stopped in his rant when he felt someone reach out and place a small hand on his arm. Turning he saw Fu standing right at his shoulder, I already told you that I don't blame you for that, and I never will, she said, shaking her head, so, please, stop blaming yourself. The two other females in the room witnessed something they'd never seen before. Even in his younger days, Naruto had never been so quick to calm down from getting overexcited or angry, but that simple touch on his arm had quieted him right down even before he'd gotten going. Jiraiya decided to step in before things got out of hand again, son, the word rolled out of his mouth before he could stop himself, but the explanation would come soon enough for his former teammate, her shock evident, but for now, he needed to get Naruto out of the office before something else set him off, why don't you take Fu and the kids down to the Chirakus? And tell Tuchi to put it all on my tab. 
he said, turning to the Rosette, you, too, Sakura. You and Naruto should catch up a bit more after so long. Naruto nodded and, not even waiting to be dismissed by the blonde cage, turned on his heel and left the room with Fu and Team Konohame right behind him. Sakura hesitated for a moment before Tsunade reluctantly nodded for her to go with him and scurried out the door. The moment the door closed, Jiraiya tapped his left foot on the floor, erecting a barrier throughout the room in case anyone was listening. Satisfied, he sighed in relief, now, we can talk, he said, frowning, you've got questions. Twenty or so, she admitted, son. Jiraiya nodded, I formally adopted him on the road just under a year into our training, he explained, it was right after he made the bingo books. Tsunade nodded, that's another thing, Jiraiya, she pointed to the book still on her desk, what the hell happened? Jiraiya sighed as he began to explain, it was stupid of me to think he could control more of the Nine Tails Chakra at his young age, he said, reaching back to scratch his neck, we didn't think anything would happen at the time, but, as it says in the book, he was flooded with rage-filled chakra and went on a killing spree. And you did nothing to stop him, Tsunade snapped, slamming her hands down on the desk, what kind of a... I was the first one he attacked, Jiraiya snapped, looking angry, and I warned you not to push him too far, and look what you did right off the bat. It's my right to know, she said, frowning, the council wanted him back right after they found out about his bingo entry, and I couldn't believe what I read, either. Naruto isn't a killer. Jiraiya shook his head, Tsunade, he's not a little boy with dreams of becoming Hokage anymore, he said, sadly, that whole incident changed him in more ways than I could have imagined. Sometimes I think he's forgotten he's even human. Jiraiya admitted, more often than not, when we're hunting down target, he fought wildly, as if he was inviting a killing blow, and he was, for that matter. He sneered, remembering a few close calls, and do you know he started drinking to drown out his nightmares? He asked, making the woman sit back down in shock, Naruto hated alcohol. I let him, thinking he'd get such a bad hangover that he'd never want to drink again, but you wanna know the cruelest thing. No matter how much he drank, he never even got a buzz. The fox. That's right, Jiraiya said, frowning deeply, I thought he was going to poison himself with sake at one point, until I realized that he wasn't anywhere near drunk, even after going through more bottles than you when you fall off the wagon. Tsunade rubbed her forehead, a headache in the making. All right, no more mentioning his bounty. And the girl. Jiraiya smiled at last, he's attached to her, and, thankfully, so is she, he said, crossing his arms, I wouldn't try to separate them, at least, not unless Fu wants to live somewhere else. Duli noted, she said, not wishing for another argument, I know I'm asking for a lot, here, but what was with his fist when he struck my desk? She asked, looking at the mark made by the boy, I swear I saw his hand turning black. That's something he picked up while training in Earth Country, Jiraiya said, looking at the mark as well, we trained in a mercenary village that had a lot of rogue shinobi there. One of them held a unique jutsu that allowed him to cover his body in a steel shell as hard as any carbonized steel. But Naruto can't control his own jutsu properly and can only coat certain parts of his body in ordinary iron. Tsunade's brow rose, I know that technique and owe it to be a keke genkai, she said, how is that possibly? We were told it was teachable, Jiraiya said, holding up his left hand for her to see. She watched him for a moment before e the tips of his fingers started to slowly turn black as it traveled down to his palm, the human body carries small amounts of iron inside of it and when controlled, it can be spread over the skin as an armor. Naruto's teacher was able to use other elements in the air and combine with the iron he formed on his skin to create a stronger steel armor, and he even managed to fuse iron into steel outside his body to create a steel projectile like a cannonball and launch in a similar fashion. And you learned it from Naruto? She asked, watching the metal skin recede, but Jiraiya shook his head. No, I trained right alongside that boy for months before he could even move a small amount of metal into his skin he said, letting his skin return to normal, it was hard enough to get us both this far, but now we have enough understanding to keep training with it on our own. Tsunade nodded, smiling at the thought how much stronger such a technique would make the young shinobi. The elders shouldn't be disappointed by his growth. She said, thinking of all the times Danzo, Himura and Kaharu had badgered her into bringing Naruto back to the village. There's something else, Jiraiya sighed, Naruto probably won't stay within the village on his downtime. At this, the woman frowned, her brow raised, and why is that? Jiraiya held up his hand, don't misunderstand, Tsunade, Naruto still cares for his friends here in the village, but it's got to do with that incident, he said, frowning, he doesn't feel it safe while in the village, and he's afraid that he'll lose control again. And just where was he planning to stay? She asked, her brow beginning to twitch, if he's needed for a mission, he'll need to be here, and if he's promoted to Jonin, then he'll need to be here for his team, should he take one. Jiraiya shrugged, for the time being, you'll just have to send a messenger toad to him. 
He sighed, you just saw his tough side, Sunade, but it's all an act, because on the inside, he's scared out of his mind that the fox will seize control again and wreak havoc. Then tighten the seal, Sunade suggested hopefully. He won't let me near it, the elder sage lamented, after the first time, neither of us wanted to risk the fox forcing more chakra out and him running wild again. Four tails worth of that monster's chakra nearly killed me, Sunade, so just think what could happen if it went further than that. The blonde Hokage sat back with a sigh, all right, I understand, she said, where will he be staying? The land of ancestors. I can't have him going that far. Sunade roared, but Jureya just held up his hand. He knows the flying thunder god technique, he said, it's how we got here so fast, and it only took moments before we landed. A messenger toad can leave here and get to him almost as fast as that by the use of our summoning contract with them. You don't need to worry. Besides, with Fu being cut off from most of her village, Kanoha will be a marvel for her. She's going to want to come back again and again, just so she can be around people, period. So I'm hoping that she'll convince him to move back here for good, or at least during the week. Sunade cocked her head slightly, are they that close already? Ureya chuckled, I'd be a fool to miss the way she looks at him, and how often she clings to him, he smiled, it's more than just a desire for human contact, it's a crush if ever I saw one. Who sneezed suddenly for what seemed like the hundredth time since leaving the office, as did Naruto for some reason. Maybe there's something messing with my sinuses. She wondered, rubbing her nose. Damn it, what's with all the sneezing? Naruto groaned as he scratched at his own nose, turning toward Sakura, so, what have you been up to since I've been away? Sakura gave a proud smile, well, you're not the only one that's been training under a sanin, you know, she said, pointing at herself, Sunade's been teaching me since before you guys left. And I've gotten pretty damn good at it. She even let me sign the slug contract. Naruto gave her a small smile, not the crooked grin he normally gave Fu, said Gurla noticed, that's great to hear. Tsunade may be a bully, sometimes, but she's definitely got the power to back it up. Sakura smirked at him and poked him in the chest, yeah, and I can still whip your butt up and down the Hokage monument, so you'd better watch it. Naruto let out a laugh, yeah, right, the blonde grinned, I've gotten stronger, too, Sakura, so no more using me as a punching bag. The girl pouted, I wasn't that bad. Was I? Naruto looked at the three genin, all together now. Yes you were. The four of them grinned, shouting loudly as Sakura hung her head in defeat. Fu giggled a little bit as she saw the little skit, more so because he was kind of picking on the other girl, instead of being affectionate. Okay, that's going too far she shook herself, it's not like he's my. He could be Chimei put in, I'd approve of someone like him, my grumpy brother aside. Fu grumbled incoherently as she followed after the five shinobi before she spotted something. They'd passed a clothing store, and in the window was a very attractive blue kimono. It didn't have any embroidery, which is what she liked most about it. Any kind of stitching tended to make the silks heavier and slightly uncomfortable. That and all she had were the clothes on her back. Literally, and those would need to be washed soon. See something you like? Naruto asked, appearing right beside her and scaring the living hell out of her again. Ah! Do you have to keep sneaking up on me like that Fu shouted, but nearly melted when he gave her that stupid grin of his. But I wasn't even sneaking, he said, grinning still, I called you like three times. Fu now looked embarrassed, ah really? Naruto nodded and looked into the window for himself, humming in thought. He turned and looked at Fu, I think you'd look great in that blue one. She blushed a little and nodded, it's actually the one I was looking at, she admitted bashfully, and yelped when he reached down and took hold of her hand, while well, wait, what? You want it, don't you? He asked, grinning again, then you should get it. But I don't have any money. Fu protested as she was dragged into the store. Naruto didn't pay any attention as he led the girl into the store and promptly spotted the clerk sitting behind her counter. She looked up from a magazine she was reading, seeming not to recognize the blonde, much to his relief, it wouldn't do for him to get thrown out just when he'd gotten back. Can I help you? Naruto nodded, pointing at the window, yeah, we'd like to buy the blue kimono you have in the window, if you have that will fit her. He said, indicating Fu. The woman came out from behind her counter and started taking Fu's measurements, much to the girl's discomfort. She hummed a moment before heading to the back room. She was back within moments with a box in her hands, this should just her size, she said, opening the box to show the article of clothing, just the right shade of blue Fu had wanted. It reminded her of her friend's eyes. Would you like to wear it? Blushing, Fu nodded and was pointed toward a dressing room as Sakura and Team Kinohimaru came in. Buying clothes, Naruto. Sakura asked, looking toward where Fu had disappeared. Naruto shrugged, she needs something else to wear other than her mission gear, and she liked the kimono she found, so I don't see a problem with it. Naruto. The store clerk asked, frowning, Naruto Yuzumaki. Naruto cursed his luck, turning around to face the woman, that's my name, he said, frowning, is there a problem? 
There's a big problem. She shouted, grabbing a broomstick from the corner and threatening the blonde with it, get out of my store. Or you'll what? Naruto asked, catching the wooden handle of the broomstick as she swung it at him, sweep me to death. He tightened his grip on the stick until it broke under his grasp, that was me being gentle. He glared at her, I came here to make a purchase for a friend, so that is what I'm going to do. And if you keep being unpleasant, I may just have to have a talk with the Hokage about a tacky little store I passed by on my way through the village. The woman paled, you wouldn't dare. Keep your prices as they are, agree to accept my money, and be nice to my friends, Naruto listed off his demands, and we won't have a problem. But do not think I'm the same as I was before I left. I don't take crap like this anymore. Sakura and Konohamaru were surprised by his aggression, slight as it was, but inside, the young Saratobi was screaming in awe of his brother figure, because he had seen just how cruel some of the adults were to Naruto at times when he did absolutely nothing. Sakura was doing much the same, although she now knew why Naruto was so disliked by the older generations. Before things could go any further, however, Fu stepped out of the dressing room, Will, she said, looking at the blonde with a blush on her cheeks, what do you think? Naruto turned and felt his jaw drop. Simple though it may have been, the blue brought out her hair and eyes, much more than the small grey outfit she had worn moments ago. It also brought out the color of her skin much more than anything. Being stared at by the blonde did nothing to bolster Fu's confidence, however, and began to fidget under his gaze, I can pick something else if you. No, no, I think you look beautiful. Naruto shouted hurriedly before nearly biting his tongue at how idiotic he had just sounded. It had just slipped out, and loudly for that matter. Fu's cheeks were light like a flame at his shout and wanted nothing more than to go hide under a rock if she could move fast enough. Konohamaru and Mogi giggled, the boy grinning ear to ear, hey, big brother, is she your girlfriend? Now it was Naruto's turn to blush as both he and Fu shouted I'm she's not my his girlfriend. Sakura giggled at the pair then, you even finish each other's sentences, she said, that's so cute. It's not like that. Both of them shouted. Amid further teasing and laughter, Naruto paid for Fu's kimono, which the store clerk grudgingly kept at reasonable prices. Fu awoke to the sounds of birds chirping in the early morning light as she rolled over, a content sigh on her lips. She opened her eyes, blinking slowly as she found herself still in her intended room. As per usually of her mornings, her clothes were askew. Sighing as she sat up, fixing her clothes, she stretched her arms above her head. Her time in the village yesterday had been fun. After getting a few more essentials for her, Naruto had taken them all to Ichiraku Raymond as Jureya had suggested. Fu had never tried fresh Raymond before, and she had to admit, she now knew why Naruto liked it so much, having watched him put away at least ten bowls, she had only managed four, herself. Not long after they had eaten, they had returned to his home away from the village. In a way, she was glad to be back in the valley. There was a huge difference in the feel of the land compared to the leaf village. Her clothes fixed, she rose and went into the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Naruto's room, right across from hers, was empty, the door left open, making the girl think that he'd gone outside to train. He's nearby Chime confirmed, giving the girl a small amount of relief. She didn't actually think the blonde would run off and leave her on her own. Sure enough, when she looked outside, it was to see the blonde himself moving in a slow martial arts kata. He must take his training very seriously if he's out this early. She thought as a small blush rose to her cheeks, noting that the blonde was again without a shirt. Shaking her head to clear her thoughts, she moved into the kitchen to start breakfast. Naruto, meanwhile, hadn't been so focused that he hadn't noticed her awake. He had been able to sense it from the moment she first stirred. Currently, as he moved through the frog fist while in sage mode, he was able to sense everything around him. Even now he could feel her moving around in the house, making food for them. It was a nice gesture. And one he wasn't used to outside of Jiraiya. Stopping his movements, he reached for his discarded shirt and towel, wiping the sweat from his body and moving back toward the house. He walked into the kitchen to find the girl setting the table, a small content smile on her face. She looked up to see him, beaming, good morning Naruto. Morning, he nodded, did you make all of this? Who giggled, well, I certainly didn't get you made to help, she said, I hope you don't mind. Rice and fish was all I could find in the scrolls you had tucked away in the cabinets. Naruto gave her a grin and sat down, it's more than okay. I haven't had anything like home cooking in a long time. Boo gave a small blush, well, then I hope you like it. They ate in companionable silence, the blonde enjoying the food greatly, this is really good, he told the girl as they ate, you're a better cook than I am, that's for sure. Probably because I've been doing it longer, she said, smiling at him, I've always been on my own, even with Shibuki's help, I had to do things myself, or starve to death. Luckily for me, Chime coached me through a lot of it. Relenting the fact that her earliest attempts had been less than favorable. The tailed beast that knows how to cook. 
She watched some of her other hosts, she explained, I got the hang of it soon after, and it's been easier with each day. Naruto swallowed the last bite of his food, a frown marring his face, I have to wonder why Chimei and Kurama are so different, he said, thinking out loud, I mean, Chimei was actually nice compared to most people I've met, and Kurama is an ass. Fu put out, smiling a little bit as Naruto winced, the fox having overheard her. Sorry, I bet he's not my biggest fan right now, is he? Naruto rubbed his forehead where his headache was throbbing from Kurama's roaring, you could say that, he said, trying to ignore the beast, but how are you two so? Close. I've heard of Kumo's Jinchuriki being able to control their tailed beasts, but I never thought I'd meet someone that got along with one. That's a fair question, and one that's never been asked Shimei chittered insider seal, truth be told, it's because of something our father wanted from us. All of us is. She said, with Fu repeating her words. Both were a little more than stunned to find that someone had created beings such as the tailed beasts, whom called him a father. You would know him better as the sage of six paths the seven tails said for their benefits. The sage was your dad. Fu asked when she had relayed the message to an equally stunned Naruto, I always thought he was a myth. The Mei laughed softly, with a myth there is always a small amount of truth, my dear. She said, indeed, Hagoromo Atsutsuki was my father. Naruto mulled this over for a moment, so if he was your father. Well, did you have a mother? He asked, via Fu. In a way, yes, but not in the sense that I was birthed like any normal being Chimei said through her container, who was just as interested in what she had to say, as the young sage was, you see, my siblings and I were once part of a greater being. The original tailed beast was called the Juubi, and my father sealed it within himself, thus becoming the first Jinchuriki. As Fu relayed the message, she herself was rather stunned. She knew that each and every tailed beast was powerful, and that the Nine Tails was possibly the most powerful of them all, given how long it had taken to finally seal him, but to think that such a thing as the Ten Tails actually existed was frightening. Naruto was about to ask another question when he heard an angry growl deep within his mind. This talk has gone on long enough Karama growled, making himself known to both humans and his sister Beast, which surprised both females greatly. Naruto groaned in pain as his left eye turned red, revealing the slit-like pupil of the nine tails in its place. Naruto's voice came out as the rumbling growl of the fox, Jamei, I've had quite enough of you divulging how we came to be. It's bad enough that you fraternize with these worms, but telling them of the old man and the ten tails. You're treading on thin ice, sister. HMPH was Jamei's quiet response as she ignored her brother's partial takeover of his Jinchuriki and settled herself down for a nap, leaving the two humans to themselves, as Kurama receded back into his proper seal, the strain on Naruto's face lifting. Uh, he muttered, looking at the table in a bit of shame, I didn't know he could do that. Who looked a little concerned, Jamei's done it once before so she could talk to Shibuki, but it wasn't pleasant. Are you alright? She asked, seeing the strain on his face return. I'm fine, it just gave me a headache, Naruto said, rising from the table to wash his plate, thank you for breakfast, it was nice not having to eat something instant for once, or just settle for toast and scrambled eggs. Fu flitted to his side with her own dishes as he let the sink fill, show me where everything is, and I'll gladly do it again, she said, bumping his shoulder with her own, I kind of owe you for taking me in, and this is the least I can do. Naruto turned his head sharply, giving her a surprised look, you don't owe me anything, and don't ever think you do, he said sincerely, if anything, I owe you everything for saving my life and looking after me along with other things. Who rinsed their dishes and placed them on the counter, enough about that, she said, flicking water at him from her hands, come on, didn't you promise Konohimaru and his friends you'd train them today? Naruto nodded and went to find his cloak. Fu waited for him outside while he dressed properly, thinking very seriously about flying there herself, rather than go through another stomach-churning trip via Naruto's technique. But the blonde came out with a sincere smile on his face as he held his arms open for her, and the girl found herself readily drifting into those bands of gentle iron, letting her head rest on his shoulder as she readied herself for the trip. She heard the rumble in his chest as he took a deep breath, ready. MHM, she nodded, closing her eyes. Naruto concentrated for a moment, hmm, the seal's getting a little worn out, he mumbled, I'll have to use a different one. Before she could ask what he meant, she felt the sensation of falling through space once again. She clutched at him for all of a moment she felt her feet touching the ground again, her head spinning slightly. Sorry about that, Naruto apologized, are you okay? Gu blinked a few times to clear her head and get her bearings, why yeah, I'm fine, but, she said, looking around, where are we? Around them was a small clearing, surrounded by a small forest and a small creek. My team's old training ground, Naruto said, smiling fondly, it's also where we're supposed to meet Abisu and Konohimaru's team. Boo nodded, her wings sprouting out so she could fly up and have a look around. 
She saw that the training ground was quite large, a good three miles all around, before it was fenced off for a different area. Then she spotted the three genin coming towards them with a jonin in tow, the latter not looking the least bit pleased. Fu sped back to the ground and landed beside Naruto, who had his arms crossed as he waited. You won't be too rough with them, will you? She asked, fearful. Naruto smirked at her, not too bad, he said, I need to see what they can do before we get to anything rough. Hey boss. Konohamaru yelled upon seeing them. Naruto's demeanor changed right away when he saw the small team coming toward them. The smirk turned up into a smile as he waved at them, hey, you three. He said, not even acknowledging the jonin. Fu frowned as the man sneered at the blonde and felt oddly creeped out by his glasses. Ibisu. He said frostily to the jonin, finally taking note of his presence. Yuzumaki, Ibisu said, his arms crossed, I understand that you will be aiding in the training of my team. Naruto's smile turned into a feral grin, showing off his canines. That's right, he said, but there's not going to any aid. I'm teaching them, end of story. His knuckles began to turn black as his skin became iron. And what makes you think you can teach the honorable grandson any better than I? Ibisu asked haughtily. Naruto looked down at the young Suratobi heir, have you shown him? The Nohimaru blushed a little, nah, I figured it'd be a waste if I did, he said, scratching the back of his head bashfully. At Naruto's gesture, the boy crossed his fingers together, shadow clone jutsu. Fu watched, impressed, as two identical clones of the boy appeared, but the boy immediately fell to his knees, and the clones dispersed. You did a good job, she said, encouragingly, hoping he wasn't put out by the failure. The Bisu looked scandalized. How? How in the world did you figure out that jutsu? I taught it to him before I left the village three years ago, Naruto supplied, grinning, but you need more physical exercise, Kinohamaru. Exhausting your chakra reserves can only do so much to increase it, you have to exhaust your body, too. Logi frowned, we don't do a lot of hard missions, she said thoughtfully. Mostly it's just us doing a few things around the village, or catching Tora. Naruto raised his brow, you've been genin for almost a year, I'm betting, and you haven't done anything more than that. He said in disapproval, looking at Ibisu. At least tell me that you've taken them out of the village. No, Yudin said, sniffling, we've been outside the walls, but not the perimeter. Even Fu had to frown at that, but even fresh genin in my village were out doing missions in the high sea ranks. Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose, do you even know your chakra natures? I do, Konohimaru said, grinning, wind and fire, just like Uncle Asuma. All Saratobi clansmen have those chakra natures, Ibisu supplied, somewhat proud, but they are far too young to learn of such things. When they are older, and of Chunin rank, then. I'm ranked as a genin, Naruto interrupted, frowning, and I already have three chakra natures, not including a sub-element. He said, holding up his iron-coated fists. I'm lucky enough to have wind and fire as well as earth, but these iron fists of mine are a nasty little bonus. The three junior genin looked at his fists in awe as they shone in the light, before the metal receded back into normal skin. That is so cool. Yudin sniffled, can you teach us how to do that? Naruto smiled at him, if one of you has an affinity for earth, then sure, I can do it easily. He said before reaching into his cloak and pulling out a small stack of papers, now, each of you take one of these and channel a small amount of chakra into it, he said, letting each child take hold of one, Kanohimaru, you go first as an example. Kanohimaru did as he was told, channeling his chakra into the paper. Fu watched as the paper split in two before erupting into flames. Kanohimaru yelped and dropped the pieces as they turned to ashes. Honorable grandson, are you alright? Ibisu yelled, looking accusingly at the blonde shinobi, how could you allow hi? Fu stamped her foot, oh, shut up already. She snapped, looking put out, the only reason that happened was because he's got a powerful affiliation to fire. It's happened to a few of my people once or twice when they had overly powerful affinities to an element. She's right, Naruto said, frowning, and his name is Konohimaru, not honorable grandson as you keep calling him. He leveled a glare at the man, Ibisu, I'm sure you've got their best interest at heart, but you have to understand that for them to advance, they have to bleed for it. He shook his head as the three youngsters looked at him, being a shinobi isn't at all as glamorous as some think it is. My first mission out of the village was supposed to be a simple escort mission, which turned into a small-scale war against a money-grubbing businessman who employed an airank shinobi from Kiri. We were unprepared. We barely managed to survive it. If it hadn't been for that same Kiri shinobi turning on him at the last moment, we'd have been slaughtered. Gu nodded her head, the land of waterfalls is a small nation and always under attack from one of the larger nations. She said, smiling at the children, well growing up, I always heard of horrible battles outside our village involving our border patrols. Being a small village, we had small forces of shinobi. Every time one of those skirmishes broke out, we would lose at least three squads of shinobi. The lands of earth and fangs were the worst because we bordered both of them. 
It was only a matter of time before one of them destroyed us for the territory. If I hadn't come along, Naruto muttered, but Fu just swatted his arm, giving him an affectionate smile. Something that made his heart flutter, either way, the moment they leave this village they could come back bathed in blood. They need to know how to defend themselves the right way. Ibisu looked a little uncomfortable at the way the blonde was looking at him. Certainly, being a jonin, he knew about the boy's status as a jinchuriki and about his entry into the bingo book. When first meeting the 12-year-old Naruto Uzumaki, he hadn't thought him capable of killing anyone, but that had been proven wrong. Gone was the foolish little boy, now a shinobi stood in his place. Elemental ninjutsu is mainly taught after reaching the rank of chunin, Ibisu argued weakly, gesturing to the three genin, while well, I can understand th I mean, Kinohimaru, learning more advanced techniques, because he is part of a large influential clan here, but Mogi and Yudin are civilian raised. Naruto smiled a little at them, well, then, this should be interesting, he said, and held out a piece of paper to both of them, Yudin, you're next. Doing as he was told, Yudin watched as his paper crumbled to dust. So this means I've got earth. That's good, Naruto smiled at the boy, reaching out to ruffle his hair, earth is a defensive element and also good for offensive techniques. He said, looking to Mogi, alright, you're next. Mogi looked back and forth between her teammates, both of them smiling at her in encouragement. Go on, Fu said, don't be afraid. Mogi sighed and channeled a small amount of her chakra into the slip of paper. What happened next surprised even Naruto. The slip of paper did nothing similar to any of the five base elements. Instead, the paper grew hard and rough as roots sprouted from it. Mogi yelped and dropped the paper, watching as the roots dug into the ground while a small tree began growing from them. In not time at all, the sapling stood as tall as Mogi herself. Both Ibisu and Fu stood slack-jawed, while Naruto's eyes were as wide as saucers. Both Konohimaru and Yudin were grinning in amazement at what had happened. You grew a tree. Yudin crowed. That's so cool. Konohimaru shouted. But the little girl wasn't listening to them, her eyes were on her new sensei. D did I do something wrong, Naruto sensei. Recovering from his shock, Naruto smiled and knelt down in front two of the girl, placing his hands on her shoulders, you didn't do anything wrong, Mogi, nothing at all, he said, reassuring the girl, like Konohimaru, you have two chakra natures. Earth and water. Both of these are great elements to use on their own, but together, they form something entirely different. Wood, Mogi. You're the first ever female wood style user. So it's decided, Tsunade smiled at the three Jonin standing before her, Naruto is due back here in a few minutes, along with the Genin team he wishes to train. When he gets here, we'll tell him about the test and when it will take place. Asuma Saratobi smiled around and unlit cigarette, it'll be good to see the kid again, he admitted, smirking as the Godim sent him a warning look while he reached for his lighter. Ah, come on, dad smoked in here for decades. I'm not your father, and I also happen to be a doctor, so I forbid you to smoke in her, Asuma, she glared, and then smirked, unless you'd like me to have a little talk with Kurinai. Asuma held up his hands in defeat and replaced the stick in his pocket. Bakashi gave a small chuckle, you really think he could take all three of us? He asked, looking at the woman skeptically, normally, I wouldn't mind such a test, because Naruto is more than ready. But with fresh genin. I want to see if he's a capable leader, she said flippantly, if his wish to become Hokage is still there, then he'll need to experience being a Jonin sensei brings. A most youthful point, Guy said, striking his usual pose, I cannot wait to see the flames of youth young Naruto will light for these three youngsters. Before the Hokage could go on, there came a knock at the door. He's early, she noted approvingly, you may enter. The door came open, revealing Naruto, a wide smile on his face, and it was a genuine smile. The first she'd seen since he'd left the village. Granny, you're not going to believe this, he said as the rest of his would-be team filed in behind him, Fu and Ibisu bringing up the rear. Mogi looked to be nervous about something as Naruto ushered her up to the desk, Mogi, here, as a wood-style user. What? All thoughts of Naruto's jonin trial went out the window, how? How in the world is that possible? She asked, looking at the small girl clinging to Naruto, she's from a civilian family, not even remotely related to the Senju. Kekei Genkai aren't always limited to one clan, Granny, Naruto pointed out, elemental Kekei Genkai manifest at random more than you can believe. I've seen and while I was training in a village of rogues in Earth Country. Some had the gift naturally, other had to develop it themselves and refine them to be just as strong. Mogi's fortunate to be naturally gifted with something like this. Tsunade sighed and leaned back in her seat, well, I can't say that this isn't a pleasant surprise. The wood style was easily the most revered of all the elemental Kekei Genkai, and now we have a young user of that same element, she smiled at the girl, she'll surely make you a fine student if you pass my trial, Naruto. Naruto grinned at her, jerking his thumb at the three jonin, I take it I'm going against them. He said, smiling at his old sensei, you haven't changed one bit, Kakashi sensei. 
it's good to see you, too, Naruto, he I smiled at him, I hear you've made quite the name for yourself. Naruto shrugged an answer, you know me, he said, smirking, turning back to the Hokage. So what will we be doing during this trial? Tsunade smiled at him, lacing her fingers together as she leaned upon her desk, you will lead these three genin of yours against my best jonin, she said, making the three genin's eyes widen, if you prove to be a capable leader while directing them in this combat simulation, then your promotion to jonin is immediate, and team Kanohimaru will be yours until they reach jonin rank. And are well off in taking care of themselves. Naruto nodded, I'd like a week to get ready for it, he said, I need time to train them, and get them used to how I train. That'll be fine, she said, also, you should probably keep yourself inside the village for the time being, Naruto frowned at this, now, Naruto, I know you have a home outside of the village, but training with this team means y'all have to be inside the village if something comes up concerning them, or a mission. If you pass my test, then you'll be able to go as you please, as long as it doesn't interfere with your duties. Naruto nodded, alright, but Fu will still stay with me, if she doesn't mind. He said, looking at the girl by his side. Gu beamed at him, a happy little blush on her cheeks, I'd love to stay with you. She said, and I want to help you train in any way you might need, okay. Naruto nodded, alright, he sighed, I guess we need to find ourselves an apartment, huh? Gu stretched her arms over her head, inhaling the fresh scent of the morning air in the land of ancestors one last time. As promised Naruto had informed her that, to her surprise, he had purchased a small piece of land that had once been an old leaf village training ground, where he would, apparently, be moving their little home. How he intended to do that, she didn't know, however she was sure he was about to do something insanely incredible again. I wouldn't dwell on it so much, little Hornichime said, for all we know, it may not be that remarkable at all. Who giggled as she turned back toward the little house. He does have a habit of turning everything upside down. She said to her friend. I'll be sad to leave this place, she said out loud as the blonde man came out of the house whilst adjusting his cloak. My seals here are stronger than most I've made, so we'll always be able to come back, Naruto assured her with a smile. He then turned back to the house himself, stand back a bit. Gu skipped behind him, feeling it was the safest option given his warning. She then watched as he placed his left hand on the wooden doorframe, a seal glowing on the back of his wrist. A sealing array appeared all along the walls of the home and glowed brightly for a brief moment before it disappeared in a puff of smoke. In its place sat a medium-sized scroll that she would normally see Shinobi carrying large amounts of weapons in. Dot oh. What a way to pack. Chimei chittered laughingly. Naruto picked up a scroll with his customary crooked grin on his face. Neat, huh? Definitely less common than the average sealing scroll, Fu giggled, but that house had electricity. How did? More seals. He smiled, you'd be amazed at what you can do with the right type of seal. I used a high-capacity lightning seal to produce power to the house. Wouldn't that run dry eventually? Naruto shook his head, I designed it to draw chakra from the surrounding area and convert it into lightning chakra, he shrugged, after that, it was just a matter of hooking the right wires to the tag, and voila, I don't have to pay an electric bill. Who giggled once more, very clever. Shall we go? Naruto asked, my team should be about ready now. Gu flitted into his arms and hugged him tightly, not even caring that it made her blush up a storm of color to her cheeks. Without warning her he activated the flying thunder god seal again and nearly yelped as she felt herself falling again before her feet touched the grassy ground of the training grounds. The effects of the teleportation seals were lessening with each use, for which she was grateful. Her stomach could do with a little less stress. Not so bad anymore, eh? Naruto chuckled as he let go of her. Betting there, Fu smiled dizzily, Jamei laughing quietly. Do you have a plan for the little ones? Naruto nodded, I do, and I could use you cooking skills as an enticement, if you don't mind. Who blinked in confusion, huh? It was just half past ten in the morning when Ibisu and Kinohimaru's team arrived. The sight that greeted them was Fu humming happily in her own little outdoor kitchen, complete with a wood-burning grill, and Naruto sitting in a meditative position. What's all this about? Ibisu demanded of the would-be jonin. Part of today's training, of which you will participate, or leave. Naruto said with a tone in his voice that left no room for arguments. He rose from his position and smiled at his future team. All of them looked eager to begin the lesson, Kanohimaru more than the others, but little Mogi looked ready to fly away with excitement. Good morning, Naruto-sensei. The trio all but chirped. And a fine good morning to you, he said, even including Abisu in his greeting. Today, we will be working on combat and strategy. Kanohimaru beamed, combat training already. All right. Yudin cheered. Abisu frowned, don't you think it's too early for? No. Naruto cut him off with a grin. The blonde reached into his pocket to produce two small silver bells, one of which he gave to Ibisu, while he tied the other to his waist. 
The object of this little exercise is to take one of these bells from either myself or Ibisu before lunchtime. Konohimaru scoffed, is that all? That'll be easy. Oh? Naruto grinned a very vicious grin, you think so? The young Saratobi's confidence did not falter. Piece of cake. Well, then maybe you should let me finish with the parameters of this little challenge, huh? Naruto smiled, just attacking one of us will not work. For you to actually pass this test, you will need to not only work as a team, but form a strategy all on your own to get a bell. You also need to come after both of us instead of just one of us. If you manage to get one bell, great, but that will not end the test. You have to try for both of us. But why? Mogi asked, looking scared at the idea of facing the older Genin. She loved Naruto like a big brother just like Konohimaru did, but she knew he was way stronger than he appeared. Simple. Naruto stated, on some missions, there are multiple targets that need to be taken down, such as rogue shinobi, or bandits, you get the idea. He said as the trio nodded, as for fighting us, we'll be taking it easy on you. Ibisu and I will be using tojutsu only, no elemental jutsu, or special techniques. You three can throw whatever you've got at us. On second thought, he gave the three genin a look that could curdle milk. No sexy jutsu, I'm looking at you, Konohimaru. Aw, come on. The boy whined. An excellent restriction, Ibisu said whilst pushing up his glasses, and I will agree to the tojutsu only on our part. Will there be a penalty should they fail? There will, Naruto nodded and gestured to where Fu was cooking, as you can see, Fu has graciously agreed to cook a meal for all of us. Fu turned and gave them a wave, I say all of us, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you three will be eating. The trio, whose mouths had been watering that entire time since they smelled the food, gaped at the blonde, you see, you need to pass my training to earn your meals. Now, let's discuss how you can win your supper. First off, obviously, you have to get a bell from one of us, that right there is an automatic win for your team, of course, but as I said, you'll need to work together to do that, he said, holding up two fingers, the second way is to impress either myself or Ibisu with whatever your strategy is. Now that doesn't mean you have to come up with something elaborate to win, sometimes a simple plan can lead to victory. Is there a third way? Yudin sniffled. There is, but I'll keep that one to myself in order to make sure you follow my instructions for the parameters of this exercise. He stepped over to Ibisu, now I've laid teleportation seals all over this area, to which Ibisu and I will each be at one and stay there until you find and engage us. You won't know where we are until you happen upon us. But if you teleport, how can we track you? Mogi asked. Ibisu chimed in, I believe that you will have to figure that out on your own, Mogi. Bingo, you have exactly three hours to complete the exercise starting right. Now. Naruto and Ibisu disappeared in a flash, leaving the three genin on their own, while Fu giggled at the looks on their faces. Better get going. Uuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
Yurei is smirked at her, only Orochimaru's death will be permanent. He said, turning to leave. What do you mean by that? Tsune demanded, hey. Answer me damn it. What do you think we can expect out of your student when we face him, Kakashi? Guy asked as he and his fellow Jonin stood outside of Naruto's preferred training ground. Well his entry in the bingo book seems sinister, and his attitude changed from when he was a child, do you believe him to be the same unpredictable boy that defeated Niji in the Chunin exams? The Kashi nodded, unpredictable, yes, but is he the same knucklehead? He shook his head sadly, no, I don't think he is. He looked at Guy seriously, I've seen the look in his eyes before. He may not show it often, but he is broken deep inside. Didn't think that would happen to such a happy kid like him, Asuma sighed, even when dad died he bounced back, and he practically raised the poor kid. Yes, but keep in mind that Naruto only kills when absolutely necessary. Recall his mission to Crescent Moon. He only killed as a last resort then. Guy reminded him. And our mission to the Land of Snow, Kakashi nodded, that was actually Naruto's first kill. Asuma took a long drag from his cigarette, Shikamaru had a story to tell about some mystical stone they encountered when they went after that stupid ferret. Bakashi sighed, and he's only just now breaking because, if the reports are correct, he slaughtered an entire village of innocent people, I were not. He frowned, we will need to be careful of him. There's no telling when Jurei has taught him. He is a sage after all, and he trained Minato-sensei in the same arts. There's nothing to have stopped him from having taught those same skills to Naruto. Then it will be a most youthful battle, indeed, if we are to do battle with a sage. A loud yell sounded from within the training grounds, sending birds flying from the trees. Kakshi chuckled, sounds like he's putting those poor kids through hell. Who winced as she heard the ruckus the training was causing, I wonder if I should be worried he'll be too harsh with them. Oh, surely not, my little glowworm. Jamei said, after all, he seems to care for them deeply, the young one with the scarf especially. And then there's that little grub that uses wood style. Who nodded in understanding as she kept up her cooking, I know, I know, but you know how I feel about children. She sighed, smiling slightly, the little girl's adorable. Careful, now, Lady Bugchime chortled, you may yet have a larvae of your own, you know. Naruto would be a fine mate if you attracted his attention. Boo's smile turned into a thousand degree blush, Chime, really. I don't think he'll. He smelled heavily of other women, little hornet. Chime said with a little harshness in her voice, not true mates, mind you, but fleeting flights of passion, perhaps to drown out his nightmares. Karama wouldn't allow him to become drunk, this I know because that old flea bag despises alcohol. Boo stopped her ministrations for a moment, thinking of Naruto in the arms of another. She frowned when the woman she pictured him with turned out to be that pink-haired teammate of his. I shouldn't think like that. She seemed nice enough. Perhaps she may sighed, but there's no denying your attraction to him, is there? Boo chose to return to her cooking instead of answering the giant beetle, lest she burn the food. Meanwhile, Naruto was trying his hardest not to laugh. Team Konohamaru was not doing well at all. Ibisu had been the obvious choice as a first target, but the seasoned Jonin had easily beaten them back as Naruto knew that he would. Still, their strategy was a good one. He thought fleetingly as the three genin moved closer to his position. At the beginning of the test, he had hidden a clone nearby as Ibisu engaged them. They had surrounded him at first in a typical manner that normally would have worked if they had been up against anyone of lesser skill than a Jonin. Konohamaru had been the frontline fighter, considering he had his clan's teachings under his belt. Yudin had been the one to try to set up traps in order to snare Ibisu so that they could steal his bell. Mogi had been the long-range fighter, using shuriken and kunai to attack before moving to another spot. Ibisu had not gone easy on them. Yudin's traps had been turned against them when the Jonin had thrown Konohamaru into them and snared him in wires and ropes. He easily dodged Mogi's thrown weapons and pinned her against a try with his own, while Yudin been bonked on the head after he made a blind charge for the bell. Naruto, once again in meditation, could easily sense the trio moving around him. With Ibisu, they hadn't taken care to make their presence less obvious to the man, but with Naruto they were much more careful. Even though Ibisu had beaten them, they viewed Naruto to be the bigger threat. Each one of them was working together to carefully set their traps before taking position around him. Do it now. That Konohamaru's shout steel was flung through the air as they unleashed a barrage of blades in his direction. Naruto smirked and flattened himself against the ground at an impossible thinness that came from his time training with the toads. It was technically a tojutsu move for evasion, well within the parameters he'd set. As the blades passed him over Naruto reinflated himself and let loose with his own kunai. Konohamaru and the others were already on the move as they circled around him to try and find their opening. To his surprise, Yudin was the one to rush in brandishing a kunai. Naruto responded with his own to block it, but found out a moment later that it was merely a feint as the boy smashed a smoke bomb on the ground at his feet. 
Naruto grinned at the tactic as he sensed Mogi coming up behind him silently and felt her reaching for his bell. He grabbed her hand in an iron grip that made her shriek. Nice try. He snarled and flung her into an airborne Kinohimaru. The pair recovered quickly and immediately went on the attack with Yuden right behind them. Naruto grinned as he began blocking blow after blow from his genin. They're doing perfectly fine. He smiled as the blonde smacked Yudin aside and hit Kinohimaru with a palm heel thrust that sent the boy into the bushes. He then got the shock of a lifetime when he moved toward the two recovering boys and felt his feet literally rooted to the ground. He looked down and found his feet wrapped in thick tree roots. He smiled fearily as he turned on Mogi while the girl had her hands clasped together and sweat beaded her brow and face. Shadow clone jutsu. Kinohimaru shouted as he charged back into the fray with a familiar blue orb forming in his hands with the aid of his clone. Behind the charging Siratobi was Yudin, determined to get the bell from him in the follow-up. Sorry big bro. Rasengan. Naruto reached out with both hands to catch the boy before the jutsu could hit and tore his feet free of the roots with brute force alone as he sidestepped Yudin's desperate grab for his bell. He whirled around with Konohimaru and his clone in hand before throwing one at Yudin while he sent the other crashing into Mogi. The clone that had hit Yudin dispersed as the boy hit the ground while Konohimaru and Mogi lay on the ground panting and bruised up from the fight. Naruto looked up at the sun, time's up. He made a hand sign and teleported them back to the clearing where Fu was waiting with Ibisu. Fu almost panicked when the blonde appeared out of nowhere but was more shocked at the state of the three genin. Naruto. You said you wouldn't be too rough with them. I wasn't, he shrugged, I was being gentle. That was gentle. Yudin moaned. Least I didn't get pinned to a tree this time. Mogi whined. My head hurts. Konohimaru complained. Naruto chuckled walked up to Ibisu, opinions. Vastly. He frowned, they didn't take me seriously at all and ended up defeated in a matter of seconds. To be fair, you are a jonin, and I'm a lot stronger than the average genin, the blonde said, as far as tactics went, they did fairly well when it came to their teamwork and drive to succeed. He placed his hands on his hips, but no bell from either one of us. That means no food, Mogi cried, I even tangled Naruto sensei's feet with roots. The bisu looked surprised, did she? He asked of the blonde. She did, Naruto smiled, I don't know if it was a fluke or if she was consciously doing it, but she managed to catch me for a moment or two. But we still failed, Konohimaru pouted. Who sighed sadly, Naruto, couldn't they? Now now, a failed mission means no payment, Naruto chastised her, grinning, but I haven't said anything about this being a failed exercise, have I? Yudin sat up, you mean we passed. You failed to get a bell, that's true, Naruto pointed out, but even though you didn't take Ibisu seriously, which led to your defeat, you didn't give up and went after me, even though you knew I was just as dangerous as he turned out to be, if not more. He said, plus there is the fact that not only did Konohimaru perform the Shadow Clone Jutsu, but the Rasengan as well. When did you learn that? Ibisu demanded. But Mogi also used her Kekei Genkai without prior training, the blonde went on with a scowl in the man's direction, and let's not forget that Yudin here kept up the charge in an attempt to get the bell from me when Konohimaru was trying to hit with the Rasengan. I am thoroughly impressed. The three genin looked beyond elated, that means we get lunch. Yeah. Alright. Wait a minute, Ibisu said, halting their celebration, you said that there was a third way to pass this exercise, Yuzumaki. What was that? Naruto grinned, showing up. Huh? Was the collective question from all of them, even Fu. Naruto smiled, a shinobi's greatest weapons are their minds and deceit. He said, I deceived you into thinking that if you didn't get a bell or impress me, you wouldn't get Fu's home-cooked meal, thus it made all of you fight harder after your disaster of a fight against Ibisu. I was still going to let you eat, either way, but told you that you wouldn't to make you give it your all. Not the three genin just stared at the blonde, fuming. Sensei. You're mean. Mogi pouted. Fu giggled at that statement and decided to give a little bit of grief to Naruto. Don't worry, she said, to make up for it, you can all split Naruto's share of dessert. Naruto looked at her with a wide-eyed expression, hey now. But the kids were already rushing to the table. Ibisu joined shortly with a smile on his face as the blonde pouted himself. Fu's face twisted as she tried to keep herself from laughing, don't worry, she patted him on the shoulder, I made plenty. Naruto raised his brow at her, now who's being mean? Pay back for teasing me so much. Fu smirked right back at him. Naruto snorted, cute. He chuckled, very cute. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.